Welcome to the Ummah Talk podcast with me, Fatima Barakatullah. Let the Ummah rise again. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Dear brothers and sisters, welcome to another Ummah Talk uh, podcast episode. Today I have with me brother Robert Dufour, uh, who is a Canadian convert to Islam. Uh, Robert uh, converted to Islam in Windsor, Canada in 2003. He completed his bachelor's degree from the University of Toronto in psychology and his master's degree in social psychology from the University of Windsor. His experiences with both the Muslim community for the uh, last 18 years and the Anglosphere his entire life gives him quite a unique perspective on the relationship between Islam and the West and the experiences of converts to Islam and how those experiences relate to the greater Muslim community. He's currently uh, the frontman for Islam for Europeans Uh, which he describes as an orthodox Muslim organization that is dedicated to healing the broken relationship between Islam and the West. He's currently writing his first book, which I'm intrigued to ask him about, on the subject, and uh, that's going to be released, uh, you know, to be be, uh, (laughs) confirmed, I guess, uh, a release date to be determined. Assalamu alaikum, brother Robert. Wa alaikum salam, uh, Fatima. Thank you so much for having me on. Having me on, I appreciate it. You know, uh, I think uh, we came across one another on Twitter, right? Like probably the first time mm-hmm. uh, you commented on something, something that I was talking about. I don't remember exactly what, and I just saw you as Robert of Canada, right? So, mm-hmm. and then <clears throat> I just um, it, it was interesting to me. So some of the things you were saying, so. And then I came across your YouTube channel, and um, and that was interesting as well. You were commenting on some of the dawah scene here as well in the UK, uh, which which I found, um, you know, I, I liked your discussions, and and then I I picked up that there seemed to be some controversy around <clears throat> maybe some of the things you were advocating. But I must say, up to now, I haven't fully fully grasped um, exactly what you're advocating first, but also um, what the controversy is, actually. Um, (laughs) And maybe you haven't fully grasped that either. I don't know. Um, But I would love to explore that with you um, in this discussion. Uh, So can you tell us first a little bit about yeah, do, do you remember the conversation that we kind of first? Oh, I, I have I've made on. so many t- tweets in the last four years. I've just, you know, been on Twitter so much, uh, almost too much, really. Um, no, I, honestly, um, I don't remember, uh, you know, the conversation we had over over. Uh, I think Twitter. it could have been, it could have been something to do with um, some kind of, ra- you know, racist o- undertones in. Um, some of the things that Muslims were saying about white converts, um, oh yeah, and some white convert scholars, <laughs> and things like that. That, that was recent. Uh, yeah. So just as a caveat, I, I'm I'm not going to name names. Uh, you know, yeah. like I think we're ta- we're either. talking more about the overall uh, zeitgeist. And yes, uh, as another caveat, um, you know, I, I understand uh, where a lot of these uh duat are are coming from well i mean i'm not going to say understand not i I can sympathize but not empathize um you know there's been a lot of mutual animosity between um uh the muslim world and the anglosphere as you know um and you know like they you know like undoubtedly many muslims have uh, experienced a uh racism uh or marginalization uh being visible muslims and, and uk is sort of like the the epicenter of that you know i'm in canada where you know there's far less animosity between islam and the anglosphere so um you know many times when people ask you know what islam for europeans is actually about um you know you know we end up 
talking about what we aren't <laughs> just to, you know, okay. clear up the misconceptions as opposed to what we're actually advocating for. Well, well, how about this? How about this? How about you start by, because I, I, I instead of jumping right into uh, what Islam for your Prince is about, I, I want to understand, you know, like where you come from, where you, what your background is. So mm -hmm. could you tell us a little bit about your background, how you came to Islam and also like some of the maybe experiences that have, mm -hmm led you to um you know your thinking today sure absolutely uh it's going to take a little while but i'll try to be as concise as possible that's fine uh i was born in 1981 in a small town in southwestern ontario um uh, which was 95 percent uh, european background um my father was a stand-up comedian um my mother uh, ran the comedy uh, business for him um, and was a homemaker um, I was raised Catholic, but we weren't really practicing Catholics. Um, I did go to a Catholic uh, grade school and high school, um, also 95% uh, European. Um, was not really a big believer in Catholicism, to be honest. And, you know, even the people I went to high school with, they didn't, very few, you know, of my classmates fully believed in the tenets of Catholicism. Um, and, you know, you know, we had a lot of philosophical discussions, you know, uh, in high school about, you know, religion and, you know, what is this life all about? And, um, you know, really had a lot of curious questions, but didn't really think about it that much. Um, I did have the opportunity to go to a mosque uh, uh, when uh, my Catholic, uh, basically my religion class, um, they had a field trip where we get to see, we had to, went to different um, uh, religious temples of other faiths. And we ended up going to the mosque where later on I would end up taking my Shahada. Um, so, but yeah, I, I guess for a while, you know, after I exited high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. My life was going nowhere. Um, I didn't go to university or college. Um, I just was living at home. Um, I didn't have a girlfriend or a fiance. And um, I was just working part-time at a pizza place that was run by Muslims. Um, they weren't practicing Muslims, but they were Turks. Um, so yeah it kind of remained dormant um you know i just life wasn't going anywhere and then and then um uh, 9 11 happened uh and you know that was a really you know jarring incident you know because uh at first i was you know really you know angered at you know uh muslims and islam because you know like you know what a horrible event to you know to see um and mm -hmm. uh but over <laughs> within a couple of weeks my, my perspective on I don't want to get into this too much, but my <laughs> perspective on, you know, what happened, you know, changed, but also the, you know, the political motivations, you know, of these Western governments um, to, you know, go into the Middle East and, and, you know, quote unquote, get bin Laden and just completely destabilize the region in the process. Um, so, you know, I was heavily involved in like anti-war uh, stuff uh, and just, you know, didn't want, you know, these Western governments to do this because, you know, um, I remember I was listening to a radio show and, you know, they had, this is back when they had, this, had that huge worldwide protest in February of 2003. And, you know, one of the radio persons, you know, one of the people who called into this radio show asked, you know, uh, you know, what's the point of protesting if it's not going to affect change in the government? And the, the radio host is like, well, I mean, one thing it'll do is, you know, it'll show the Muslim world that, you know, we don't agree with what our government is doing. Um, mm. You know, so, We'll get back to that later. So, um, you know, I was a very inquisitive person. And, you know, one day I was, you know, alone, all alone, uh, still living with my parents. But at, late at night, I typed up, you know, Islam on the Internet because I wanted to know what it was all about. I had, you know, watched Malcolm X a few times. and um, You mean and, the uh, movie? You know, the movie. Yeah, the Spike Lee movie. Oh, yeah, Spike. Um, and uh, the first website I went to had a picture of an unborn baby in the mother's womb. And I just like. Did I enter the right website? I mean, what does this have to do with Islam? <laughs> and uh, oh. it was actually the website where they talked about all the different uh, scientific uh, miracles in the Quran. So, mm. you know, I was hooked. I was like, there's no way a human being could physically write this book. It's just impossible. So I started researching Islam on my own for about eight to nine months. I didn't tell anybody about it. Um, mm. And wow. um, yeah, in November of 2003, it was during Ramadan. And, uh, I ended up, you know, working up the courage. I went, <laughs> I made it to the mosque a few times, but I was just so terrified of entering it because, you know, I was thinking to myself, like, 
you know, like, what are they going to think about me? What am I going to say? So, you know, the third, finally, you know, in November 15th, 2003, I worked up the courage to actually enter that mosque. And I talked to a brother there from the Tabliki Jamaat. And uh, he said, why are you interested in Islam? It's just like, well, in my opinion, there's no way that a human being could write this book. It's just not possible. It's got to be written by God. And, you know, so, and then I took my Shahada there and, you know, that, that started my journey, my 18 year journey up until this point. Um, I told my family a week later, they had no problem with it. Alhamdulillah, they, you know, they're very accepting. Um, uh, but still, it took a long time. It was quite a quite an adjustment because I was living in this small 95% uh, white town, uh, no Muslims at all. Um, and the nearest mosque was in Windsor, which was half an hour away. Um, so you're basically living in two different worlds. And even though my you know parents had a positive image of Islam, um, they just didn't want to go to the mosque. It was just like, they, you know, that you wanted to tell them about this, you know, beautiful religion, but it's just, just so many barriers. Um, and they're just, they just, just didn't want to, just didn't want to go there. And at the same time, the Muslim community, they were very reluctant to see my parents. And, you know, so, I mean, that was, you know, one thing that, you know, we can get into a little bit later, but moving along, um, you know, me, I converted around the same time as a good friend of mine, you know, we were, he was, a uh, another, um, a white Canadian convert. And, you know, we noticed that, you know, we were trying to, you know, work on these convert programs and, you know, because what we were seeing is that a lot of converts are basically converting to Islam. And then a few months later, you didn't, ditch, didn't see them anymore. You know, they would just exit the Muslim community and sometimes leave Islam altogether. And, um, you know, the Muslim community was trying to still get established, um, you know, and dealing with, you know, Islamophobia and uh, they didn't really have a lot of solutions as, you know, I mean, they, what they did was try a lot of these convert programs, you know, like, oh, someone converts to Islam, um, you know, let's get in the convert package, you know, like the, the free carpet mm -hmm. books and, um, mm -hmm. you know, like the trips to Mecca. Uh, but it wasn't really addressing the issue. It was more like it was just a square peg for a round hole. Um, before, so, before we move on, before we yeah. move on, you said the Muslim community didn't want to meet your parents. What what do you mean by that? Um. Well, it's not that they don't want to meet them. It's just, you see, a lot of these, a lot of uh, mosques, especially in Canada, I don't know how it is in the UK, but, um, the, you know, the mosque is like the center where everything in the Muslim community happens. And, you know, they're the, the conventional method of reaching out to, you know, the greater community is by having things like open houses or having them come to the mosque. Um, and this presents a huge barrier because, a lot of Westerners are even terrified of entering a mosque. And when you have this kind of, um, you know, like de facto uh, policy that everything has to be done in mosque, um, you're only going to get a certain subset uh, of people of the non-Muslim population. So it's it's like a selection bias. Only people who have a, a very rosy image of, of Islam are going to want to enter, you know, this, the, uh, you know, the mosque. Um, or, you know, you get the person who's, doesn't like Islam at all, but is, you know, so brave that they'll actually want to enter this, I guess, you know, people say, okay, well, let's set up Dawa booth so we can actually reach the people. Well, that's better, but still, it's kind of like you're creating, there's still a lot of things that people don't want to talk about when it comes to Islam, because, you know, let's be honest, they're afraid of being doxxed. They're afraid of losing their jobs. They're afraid of being seen as a racist. Um, so they end up not talking about these things. Um, so so yeah, you that, mean that, that the Muslim community didn't go out of its way to find a way to kind of meet your parents is that what you mean like or make it conducive for them to be feel, to feel welcome is that well i don't think they you know did this on purpose but i, I what they mm. did was in the, in, what they did was try to follow the medina model uh where they would have a born muslim pair up you know with a new convert uh to help them get acclimated to the muslim community Right. So but mm. what they were finding is that this was kind of falling on its face, because even though these born Muslims were very sincere and they wanted what was best for these converts, what they would do would just, you know, call them, you know, uh, every couple of days or once every week to see how they were doing. Right. Um, you know, and in the meantime, a lot of these converts are going through enormous problems with their family. Um, and, you know, it was just basically, hey, how are you doing? It's just, you know, that it's very difficult. These even the volunteers, they just did not want to 
enter into discussion with their family to ameliorate the situation. And at the same time, their non-Muslim family doesn't want to reach out to them. So, you know, you're, you're basically, these, you have two groups that are basically never communicating with, with one another. And, you know, it's a whole discussion about um, what converts actually need. And, um, you know, the, the most important thing for converts when they convert to Islam is to ameliorate the situation um, with their family. Um, mm. And when you have a, a Muslim community that, you know, let's be honest, I mean, there's a lot of fear, anger and resentment, which to a large extent is understandable um, in doing that. And on the opposite end, you have your non-Muslim family that, you know, they don't even want, if they have a negative opinion of Islam, they don't even want to hear the word Islam. I mean, it, it's taboo. Mm. Yes. And, uh, you know, you're in a situation that is completely opposite of what the Dais online are facing with. You know, because you know, with the dies online, they're dealing with these Islamophobic anti-Islam people um, and, you know, they ha who have a lot of anger towards Islam and are spreading, you know, all these half truths and, and rumors and things. Um, and in kind, you know, you know, they have to respond aggressively. But for converts, we can't do that. I mean, I can't imagine us talk some, talking to our non, uh, you know, non-Muslim Islamophobic uncle and saying even half of the things. <laughs> that they say in these conversations, we would get kicked out of the house. So there's direct, um, you know, impacts that that occur, you know, for people who, you know, have to deal with this on a on a, on a daily basis. What did and, you, you wish? Sorry, continue. Go, Sorry, I don't want to interrupt you. Well, I was just going to say the other thing is that a lot of Westerners are interested in Islam, but they don't, they can't, they don't want to convert to Islam publicly and then join a Muslim community publicly. That's a totally different. Yes. you know like level you have to reach so a, a lot of times you know like they don't just end up not converting in the first place because the muslim community they just wouldn't be able to deal with the fallout of them you know getting kicked out of their house or losing their job or you know have their husband or wife wants a divorce because they converted to islam um i mean if the muslim community were to try to take that on with the conventional methods that we use now I mean, the cost would just be astronomical. I mean, it's just, and that that's, you know, part of the angle that we're coming at here. It's it's not, I think we're not trying to criticize current Dawa efforts. It's just that um, it's just, you could say it's, it's necessary, but not sufficient. Um, so what do you wish had happened? Like when, when you say like with regards to your parents, for example, <clears throat> um, what do you think you did need um, that the Muslim community might have been able to provide or, you know? Well, what we're advocating for uh, is that we're, if, well, I mean, it, not just, I don't know about the Muslim world, but when Muslims are living in a non-Muslim country um, and the converts of that country um, have, you know, basically have to lose their, basically enter into a whole whole new community with a di completely different culture. Um, the best thing that they can do is advocate that the converts from that region uh, collectivize uh, and form, you know, their own organizations and basically form a sub-community just like all other Muslim communities have done so uh, in the West. Not to separate ourselves from the greater Muslim community. You can still be involved. You can still give all the Muslims there their full Islamic rights. But in order to fully address these issues, um, the converts to Islam need to collectivize um, so that their non-Muslim uh, sphere can see basically a synthesis of Islam uh, and uh, their culture, their traditional cultures. So that way they can, you know, um, incorporate, um, you know, the traditional dress and cuisine and architecture um, and, and so on and so forth, sports and games and, and things like that. Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, let's say, for example, if you create this physical center, all Muslims would be allowed, they would be allowed to pray there. They, you know, they would give them, we would give them all the Islamic rights that they have given to us with all the things that they've, you know, the institutions that they have already created. Um, but in order to fully address these issues, you need a place where our non-Muslim community, uh, would feel more, um, uh, willing, uh, to come in and, and talk to people, you know, who come from the same, uh, background. That doesn't just go for the Anglosphere, but Japan, Korea, wherever Muslims are, um, you know, they're not seeing the, basically the non-Muslim populace is not seeing this cultural synthesis. They see the Muslim community 
it's not just as a totally different religion, but also, you know, they're coming from a totally different culture. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So that's interesting. So <clears throat> let me ask you something. Um, did, so when you got married, uh, I'm assuming you got married mm -hmm. at some point after that, uh, did you marry into a, like what, did you marry into a heritage Muslim family or not? Well, my first two marriages were two other converts who had converted before uh, we had even met. Uh, okay. So as, as I said before, my family had no problem with my conversion to Islam. But now you're entering into a marriage where when you're entering into a marriage where <laughs> the family is completely opposed to Islam, you really start to see the other side. Um, and, uh, you know, there's you basically can't talk about it. Um, the best thing you can do. Uh, is try to be the best person that you can be, um, and you so know, you mean your you mean your ex-wives' mm -hmm. families? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Were uh, were, were anti-Islam as well, right? Or they were anti-Islam? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, again, mm -hmm. that's you don't want to use these black and white terms. I mean, there are varying levels yeah. of animosity. I you mean, know, there was animosity. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. I mean, even if usually it's just one or two family members um, and the rest are kind of like, you know, in limbo or they don't want to talk about it because, you know, it's just such a taboo uh, subject. So you kind of have to go with the flow. Um, but I think over time, once you, you know, once they see that, you know, this person is, you know, following the um, manners of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um yes and sees you know this kind of you know marriage uh between their son or their daughter-in-law or their daughter and their son-in-law um you know that inshallah is, is a much better strategy uh at warming the hearts um yes. and that's another thing that we advocate for is that once you help these people these converts collectivize into 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 a cohesive group not only can they help you know um uh, improve the relationship with each other's families but then those groups you know those the people in that group actually start to intramarry. Um, and then you not only have, and then you grow the sub community within, you know, the, the native population from the ground up. Um, so that so, way so you never married into a Muslim family. No, no, no. Uh, well, Were my current you? marriage is to a, a, a born Muslim. She's a Syrian. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to understand, like, because I guess a thought that comes into my head is, you know, like, especially in the UK anyway, because I, I can see it in the from the UK perspective, <clears throat> most converts don't marry into their own, you know, like, don't marry converts, right? Um, they'll marry into a Muslim family, um, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. And so, and even within my own family, you know, we have converts. We have European Muslims who've, uh, you know, Bosnian Muslim who's married my sister. <clears throat> and one of the things that I notice is that that probably sets a different tone for the relationship of the of the convert with the Muslim community, simply because immediately, like with my brothers in laws, you know, they're they're basically being embraced by this family, right? The, this this family that loves them um and that feeds them and you know i'm not saying it's you know easy because obviously any cultural change is not easy right from both sides if you think about it right um but at the same time i think it's a different experience and maybe maybe the animosity is felt less because well, yeah yeah, well, uh, it's it's a multifaceted issue. And I understand these are very sensitive subjects. Um, mm. Let's let, let, let's look at it from a couple different angles. And I'm not saying that these marriages can't work out. You know, I've seen many, I've seen many marriages where uh, converts marry born Muslims and it works out, you know, fine. Um, you know, but in my well, well, what I'm saying is, is that's the majority. That that's is the majority. We, we don't have the option to marry. Like, let's take for the African American Muslim community, for example, they converted to Islam en masse, right? So it, it's a lot easier for them to find someone from the African American community to marry. Um, but with the Europeans, it's complete, it's a completely opposite. But aren't you uh, assuming situation? that they want to? <laughs> like, because I know lots of converts who actually 
loved the fact that they were well, getting married into and a that, different, and that's I mean, fine. they weren't even thinking they weren't even thinking about it as though they're marrying into a different community they f fell in love with a particular person or they 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 wanted to marry this person right well, that, um and that's fine but i think like i said for a lot of westerners i mean if that's one of the few options that westerners have to convert to islam um and you know uh supplant you know the social loss that they're going to experience but when that becomes a prerequisite to converting to islam um in order to survive many people just aren't ready to do that i mean this is something i mean if you, you look at the muslim world by and large muslims in the muslim world don't marry outside of their own culture i mean muslims don't marry other muslims from an adjacent city in the same country most of the time and there are reasons for this i mean we could say that it's racist but um you know there are good reasons why they do this i mean we don't date in islam first of all so usually the family will look into marrying you know like uh, finding a a spouse for their son or their daughter um and you know like they can investigate and see you know if this person is going to be compatible they can look into the family history they can see you know this this person you know does he have um you know maybe maybe it's a great person but they're just not the cultures aren't going to match um so there's yeah, all yeah. these checks and balances that go into place compatibility basically compatibility yes. is is a consideration like right I, I met some some teenagers or some students the other day and they were in a Q&A and they were saying to me well you know my my parents don't want me to marry outside my culture <clears throat> and uh, isn't that really un-islamic um and i said to them actually no not necessarily uh because actually in islam we do have a concept of kafa, uh, kafa yes yeah. of, of compatibility so that is a consideration like it's not nothing basically right oh, but what i'm saying uh, fatima is that for mm. converts we don't have this family structure in place at all right so you know like we don't date first of all so we can't find out about the person that way and on top of that you don't have a muslim family to look into a spouse for you to see if they're going to be compatible or not and that's yes. why the vast majority of marriages i've seen from born muslims to converts end in divorce um this is really? something that's really not talked about because it's hard it's uh, it's really difficult to analyze because when these divorces happen you can't statistically analyze them i mean a lot of these i talked to a lot of these converts and they after and after you know divorce after the divorce happens it just really falls apart with their non-muslim family because they get into this i told you so attitude and you know i'm not trying to lay, lay blame at the uh born muslim family it's just you're in a we're in a situation where we're just not part of the ecosystem and when you're trying to basically copy and paste what born Muslims do and then put it onto converts, a lot of the times it just it just doesn't work out. It's not copy and paste. I mean, look, I I, I perfectly you know I can see that it's a, a massive thing that's happened. You know, there's there's a huge change happening. Change is always difficult, and this is a new situation, very much a new situation, right? So you, I I, I completely get that. The, and I completely also appreciate the idea that any community, when they recognize a collective set of issues, should get together and try to ad address, you know, those issues because they're feeling it, they're, you know, obviously experiencing it, they need to deal with it. What I'm a little bit not seeing, right, is maybe because of the converts that I know, um, I feel like their experiences are very disparate. Like there are converts who are completely, are, are like over the moon with being Well, this, these are the converts culture. that make it. This is, it's a selection bias. Yeah. These are the converts that have made it, you know? So, you know, it's And not I mean, that... they don't necessarily have to lose their identities, you know? But... It's almost like they forge, obviously this, this needs, this, this the prerequisite to this is a family that's open you know like the the, the heritage muslim family who they marry into has got to be you know open uh giving them space wanting to meet them halfway etc right um not imposing anything on them right um but at the same time i see i see converts who marry into muslim families uh being very 
being better supported in many ways because because sometimes they've especially when you have kids it's really tough to have animosity with your with the grandparents you know on both sides oh my god mm. you know that's yeah that's and, a and, nightmare and, and so, it's, again i'm not laying blame at the born muslim community this is a problem yes, inherent yes. in the anglosphere right so mm. when, when you look at other um uh you know communities outside of you know europeans that have embraced islam you know this lingering animosity isn't there like if you look at the zotzil muslims in in mexico um, you know, it's still there a little bit because they're, they're you know, like aunt, their grandparents may have been Catholic. But as you're saying, you know, like it's a lot easier for them to convert as a group because marrying another Zotzil Muslim, um, you know, there's not as much animosity there. So there's a much like better likelihood that even if, the you know, the both sides of the family, if they don't convert to Islam, you know, there's still that understanding there. But what has happened to Europeans is that there's so much animosity within the Anglosphere that not only is it incredibly difficult to express one's Islam publicly, uh, but also marrying another European convert. Now you have to deal with two families that hate Islam, right? So, and, you know, like European nationalism, they'll talk about, you know, declining birth rates and the fact that, you know, uh, you know, Europeans are, you know, like basically dying out. Um, but the paradox is the more they're hating on Islam, um, the more that it's impossible for, you know, European converts to marry each other <laughs> to increase the European birth rate. So, uh, that, that's do, the do you think? Like do you think European? Worse. So do you think? Because I'm just thinking, is it just a numbers issue that there just aren't that many converts anyway? Right, the pool of converts is not that that high in number. Well, there, so yeah. so the choice to marry is not going to be, you know, you're not going to have that much choice, right? If you do want to marry within your own uh, culture, right? Yeah, that's one thing. The other thing is. So, so so won't that just be solved in a few generations anyway, right? With the number of converts increasing and their children, et cetera. Well, no, like I said, well, here's the thing. The statistics from the last that I've seen is probably worse now. But even in the early 2000s, we kept hearing the statistic that 75% of converts to Islam end up leaving the deen. And I can provide you the, the evidence, the, the, the link for that. Um, and what you know, do you put that down to? Oh, how much time do you have on this podcast? <laughs> the top three things. What are the top three things that you put that down to? Um, not having a sub community where you know you can have the issues addressed uh, from you know the, from your family and your community. That's one thing. Um, where you know you have com other converts that can you know um, you know act as advocates on your behalf uh, for your family. Two is um, the lack of a positive European Muslim identity. So usually when a European person converts to Islam, it's a complete rejection of one's former identity, especially now because your um, identity politics has become so huge uh, nowadays. Um, you know, and uh, I guess third, third, I guess, would be the mutual animosity between, you know, um, the, you know the Muslim world and, and the Anglosphere. Um, you know, so yeah, I mean, you're basically caught between okay, two so worlds. <clears throat> let's, let's talk about each of those. So the sub community, uh, issue, not, they're not being a sub community. How, how did you put it? Sorry. Uh, not being, a... there's no, there's no collective sub community of, of converts from that particular group. When you don't have that, it just, it, it, it becomes very difficult to convert to Islam in the first place. And, you know, it just becomes a lot easier to exit. Yeah. Okay. So, um, for that, like, uh, here in the UK, for example, uh, there are, I would say organizations like, uh, set up by converts or retreats, you know, the, the organization I used to work for my era. I know it sounds like a short term thing, but it's mostly run by, you know, Abdurrahim Green, et cetera. Right. Like the, it's run by converts or it was set up by converts use of chambers etc <clears throat> and so some of the programs they put in place like new muslim retreats um that was that's obviously for usually for very new muslims but then support systems that and, and organizations that have been set up uh where there has, there are circles where converts meet um don't you think that's 
going some way. I, I'm, I, there's look, definitely I, not enough. There's I'm definitely not, not enough. Well, well, I was saying it's not enough. Again, look, th these are massive organizations, and I'm not trying to denigrate them in any way. I mean, mashallah, yeah, they're yeah, doing yeah. incredible know. work, and they're very. I'm just describing some of the efforts that are already taking place. Well, look, and is is that the direction that you? Well, are look, encouraging? It, no, because it, it's a look, look at the, look, look at the things that you described. You know, rich, most new Muslim retreats. Um, I, I'm sure there's like you know courses to learn Islam, like Islam 101, and those are all great things. But none of the things you described talk about ameliorating the situation with one's family inside this Anglosphere that they're living in, right? So, I mean, think about it. And the right. people who yeah. enter, enter these new Muslim groups, I mean, mashallah, a lot of them turn out to be great converts. But, you know, like it's it's not designed for the average person who convert who is thinking about converting to Islam, but they don't want to because their family is going to have such a negative reaction to it. I mean, you can throw all the money you want at it, at, at these you know new converts, so like trips and, mm. and books and all these things. But if it's not going to ameliorate the situation with their family, I mean, they're going to leave, they're going to exit Islam in the, or they're not going to convert to Islam in the first place. So you think if there was like a already a visible community of convert Muslims, right? Absolutely. Uh, that would mean that like a new convert coming in would have this... Yeah. People who have had a similar experience to them, who yeah. understand what they've been through, uh, or what they might be about to go through, um, and can guide them through that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and another thing is that these massive organizations, you know, they're in huge metropoles like London or maybe Birmingham, right? So yes, yes. A lot of people who convert to Islam come from rural areas, so they don't have the means and the resources to get to these places. And a lot of these masjids that are in small cities or towns they don't have they don't even have even a semblance of helping out converts and if they were to the amount the amount of money they would have to spend would just be astronomical like let's say for example a hundred westerners you know converted to islam um and you know from like you know just an average crowd not like the the convert you see that becomes like a superstar where their family was very liberal and they had no problem with it i mean think mm. about it the muslim community would have to provide room and board uh, you know a, a new job uh, a new family, um, you know, like they wouldn't have the money and the time and the resources to do this. And a lot of mosques are running on shoestring budgets anyway, and they're trying to address the needs of their own born Muslim community. Uh, and then to for ha to ask a mosque to have to take this on. And, you know, the African-American community, they see this and rightly so. They criticize it because they see it as an example of, you know, uh, this kind of white saviorism or white supremacy in that the people who are going to need these resources the most are going to be white converts. African-American converts already have a, a collective Muslim identity. Converting to Islam for them is like an affirmation of one's identity, like a rite of passage. They have, you know, like mm. millions of African-American Muslims, you know, that have no problem talking to their family and their family has no problem talking to them. So they already have this structure set in place. So the mosque doesn't have to spend thousands of dollars once, you know, they're, I'm not saying that. So isn't that I'm, due to just the sheer numbers of African American converts and and also yeah. the whole culture of I remember there there was a period wasn't there when it was very obviously because of the stuff that they've been through right mm -hmm. um there was a outright rejection really of um western culture right like yeah. I I met some African Americans in Egypt I used to live with them and uh, they, they'd now c come to Islam proper, as in Orthodox Islam, but they'd gone through this whole process of Africanism, you know, wanting to be African and, uh, and then eventually coming to Islam, the ones that I met anyway. Uh, so there was already this kind of, there's already a culture amongst the African American communities where there was a rejection of or a, a re, what's the word, like reclaiming of one's heritage, right, identity. And then now it's almost like there's a new forging of a new identity. Uh, but that's yeah. probably because of sheer numbers as well, right? Well, no, it's not just because of sheer numbers. I mean, you don't see the equivalent thing. I mean, you don't see the equivalent thing happening with Europeans. I mean, when we convert to Islam, we're a traitor. We're a traitor to you know our people. Um, 
you know, it's it's just a, just a complete yeah. opposite experience, right? So I, I mean, sheer numbers, but also the history, you know, the well, historical the context. Yeah. And that's the reason why you, they have these sheer numbers. I mean, there's, you know, yes. like, you know, converting to Islam for them was like a rite of a rite of passage collectively. Um, so that's why we have so much support from the African-American community for this. Um, right. they, and even if you read Malcolm X's autobiography, he actually mentions this, that, um, well, at the time, he didn't, he didn't think that white people would convert to Islam en masse. But he did say that anti-racist whites uh, should form all white groups and give uh, Dawa to their own people and teach anti-racism to their own people. Um, and that they would still collaborate with the black Muslims. Uh, but that's something that they needed to do because don't try to prove yourself to be an anti-racist in front of us, uh, you know, work on your own people. Um, you know, so, I mean, so even what Al Malcolm X advocated for is even more extreme than what we're advocating for. We're not even advocating yeah. for an all white group. So, I, I mean, uh, yeah, I get that. It, it, but, but he was on, he was on a particular, uh, particular stage of his own journey as well at that time, but I do get it. Yeah. I mean, he, he could see the benefit of, collectively addressing a problem right from within your own yeah. community before you start because that's what even like the whole nation of islam was kind of advocating right like fix ourselves fix ourselves up sort ourselves out pick ourselves up be independent and uh so even when he converted to islam proper i feel like he was still addressing some of those problems right um well, but he I mean, was the, becoming the, becoming close. Like if you look at his sister Ella Collins, she was not as uh, I don't feel that she. I feel like she was more integrated, you know, in the general Muslim community, um, and that's probably what brought her to Islam in the first place, uh, proper. And then she kind of nudged him in that direction. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I, I get it, you know that. So, so really, what you're advocating is because you're married to a a, a non-convert, right? So, you you can't be advocating separatism, right? Like, I, I find that I find that like laughable, really. Um, it seems what you're advocating is it's about time that uh, white Muslims or converts, I don't know, um, get together and start getting more organized and addressing some of the collective problems that they see are out there um, and provide almost like a, a welcoming space for other white people, right? Because I'm, I'm just translating Anglosphere as white people. I don't know if, that, if you think that's accurate. Well, well, I mean, if you look at Spain and Portugal, I mean, you know, they're you know, darker skin than many Arabs and Asians. So that's, that's why it's Islam for Europeans and not Islam for whites. I mean, that's such a loaded. So you term. mean heritage, can we say heritage Europeans? Is that? Sure. Yeah. yeah. That, that mm. might be a better. Um, so you're advocating for them to then have an easier passage in a way, right? What yeah. you see as an easier passage to embracing Islam, to being, to, to, I guess, um, crossing that that chasm you know well it's not just about people converting to islam I mean, we have to look at the entire spectrum here right so um right yes you know like there are so I mean, families well the it's wider not, community exactly and this will change uh the opinion of islam in the anglosphere pretty much overnight uh because a lot of you know europeans it's or you i guess you know, the talking about the european right um you know, it's basically divided into two uh, camps. And a, a lot of Muslims didn't know this for the longest time, uh, you know, because they've only been seeing the first camp, which is like the liberal um, anti-Islam uh, pro-war uh, Zionist crowd, like your Tommy Robinsons and your Anne Marie Waters and Douglas Murray. These are the people who get all the attention, who get all the book deals, who get all the media uh, support. Um, so, you know, that's one camp. And that's the only camp that the Muslim community has been seeing because the only other camp, um, they've all been deplatformed. Um, so they can't see that, you know, there's a large chunk of, of, of people on the European right whose gripe isn't about Islam per se. It's that they're having a, a complete loss of 
of cultural identity. Um, you know, so, but that group is, and again, you know, you know, uh, you know, we're not advocating for their positions either. Um, but you know, they have, they would have that, they, you know, a lot of people say, you know, from that group that this idea, if, if Muslims were to implement this idea, you know, we wouldn't have any problem with Muslims at all. Um, you know, they would see, wow, like Muslims actually do care about our culture. Um, and, you know, a lot of them ha have more positive attitudes towards Islam. It's more of a, a spectrum. Um, I think you saw this, and I'm not going to name names, when one of the popular Dais did an interview with one of these gentlemen. Um, and, you know, he thought that this guy was going to be like this, you know, anti-Islam liberal. So the first hour of the of the of the debate or discussion was him thinking that, you know, this guy's like a liberal and really, you know, he had more in common but with Islam than, you know, he he ever would have believed. Um, and, you know, like I'm not saying this to, you know, disparage that particular guy who did that interview. I think if any other Muslim would have did the same interview, it would have went the exact same way because, you know, like we've only seen like the anti-Islam crowd. And, you know, if you don't really have your finger on the pulse of the Anglosphere, you're going to think that every, you know, European on the right thinks this way. Um, but, but don't you think that those da'is are not really a good representation of, mm. like, I, I feel like sometimes if you were only to rely on the online space, right, um, you'd think that da'is were a bunch of, you know, mad sort of ranting, uh, you know, aggressive male kind well of. i mean uh they're the de facto face of the muslim <laughs> men right they're the de facto face of the muslim but but, but, but what i'm trying to say is that it's it's a bit like i don't want to say it's an act but you know there is a certain level of uh entertainment factor and stuff like that that's going on on the internet at the moment i think like especially with the the dower in the park stuff and you know uh um I don't think it's a representation of what's really happening on yeah on the ground you know because I'm at university I see the interactions between uh professors and students and you know um yeah conversions amongst professors as well um mm. and students uh and and the real world do you know what I mean like do, do you not think that sometimes um the online space gives a warped view of what's actually I, happening i would agree with that fatima I, I completely agree with you um you know once you step out into the real world you realize that you know um that the social media world is just a, a place where it's just the garbage dump of people's thoughts <laughs> and you know people just say whatever they want to say and they take one there's a comment. lot of extremes there are a lot of extremes right that exist online and that and they get yeah. exacerbated because the extremes always get the highest views, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like the calmest, nicest conversations uh, usually don't get seen as as much, right? Yeah, I mean, this conversation is probably, sadly, not going to get as many views as <laughs> some of the other, uh, you know, conversations that you see uh, online. Um, but, I mean, the fact remains is that, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, like people are still non-Muslims are still looking for, you know, what Islam is all about. And, you know, like right now they're just seeing one of two extremes, like, you know, as you stated, you know, the, the back and forth between, you know, the Da'is and like these anti-Islam ex-Muslims who are getting far more screen time and representation now that, you know, they're in the spotlight. Uh, yeah. I, <laughs> and, I don't like those at all, by the way, because I think that A, they're not, they just come across very fake, very kind of, you know, clickbaity, unsincere conversations, you know, to be honest. Um, yeah. And also they're, they're just counterproductive. Like, what is the point? Like, literally, yeah. what is the point um, yeah. of having those conversations with people who you already know um, right. or have made up their minds or you know, you're already setting it up to be a confrontation, you know? Yeah. Um, it's not like a sincere exchange of, compassion and understanding between human beings right no absolutely not and you know like i mean i mean that those types of conversations are, are not productive you know uh when it's you're talking about muslims talking to non-muslims on the street or you know, the other like you said the relationship you have with your professor or you know the bus driver or whatever um and it definitely isn't 
you know, like compatible with what converts are going through, which is to, you know, improve the situation with their family. I mean, there's no way we'd be able to get away with saying this stuff, this stuff to our family. I mean, some of the memes that these dyes have created, like it's on their own telegram channel. So it's kind of like, you know, between just between them and their followers. It's just absolutely horrible. I mean, it's just, it's terrible Dawa. It's not, it's anti Dawa. Don't I mean, you think that most, most like non-Muslims won't see those anyway? Well, they, they are. That's, I mean, they are seeing that, uh, but you know, they're seeing. I mean, they're crowd. more likely to see that than they are to have a decent interaction with a Muslim. Well, I mean, it, see, because that's where, where I would like to focus. I, I, I would like to advocate yeah. for people. Look, forget the online space. Like, it's gonna. It's basically. Sorry to say it, yeah, but it's like quite immature men usually right brothers who are figuring out their own identities in a way but they're doing it in a very public way right mm -hmm. they've got a lot of they're hot-headed they've got the the kind of what you would call the enthusiasm of youth right i think over time they're going to calm down you know probably inshallah um and it's a bit like a show right it's just like a show that's going on in the background but in real life in everyday interactions you know, um, some of our Dawah organizations, what we've been advocating is uh, encouraging Muslims to be well uh, equipped with having compassionate relationships and Dawah conversations, becoming more self-aware, you know, as a community when it comes to our interactions. There's a lot of interfaith stuff going on as well, you know. Uh, right. I feel like that's the real landscape of, you know, mutual understanding between between european heritage people and muslims i agree i agree to a large extent um you know but the fact that remains is that these you know online you know areas are, are always going to remain it's still going to be a lightning rod for you know increasing you know anger and hatred between this, uh, europeans and muslims and i mean you know the the fact of yeah. the matter is these people are, are going to are the de facto face of the muslim community i mean i do wish they would uh you know mature up a bit <laughs> i must say i, oh, I, I mean, do sometimes wish you know maybe i should reach out to them myself and you know, some of them and, but but in a, in a I mean, way i sort of let it go because i think they're sort of like like i said they're unfortunately going through like they're, they're just immature they're just literally going through growing up in pub, but it's very public. I feel. Well, I mean, the, the, like I, I mean, here. Well, that's one crowd. I mean, the other crowd is that a lot of left progressive Muslims are, you know, like they're allying with a lot of these left wing organizations. Oh yes. Um, and you know, like they've, you know, tossed this. They've, you know, given up their Islamic ethics for you know joining organizations because they feel marginalized and they want to you know, like ally with all these different groups, but all these different groups, you know, they absolutely despise the Anglosphere. So I'm not saying, I mean, of course, like organizations mm. like IRA, IRA, I mean, there's a lot of Muslims who are, you know, who feel a part of these organizations. They represent how they feel about, you know, being a Muslim in the West uh, and they want what's best for the Muslim community at large and for converts. Um, yeah. So I'm not- And a lot of converts course. are involved, by the way, you know, like they're actually forming- they are the trustees, you know, they are the ones who uh -huh. are, who are designing these programs as well. Right. Right. Saying. And, I, and I'm not, uh, yeah. you know, like discrediting the work that they do. Mashallah, they're doing wonderful course, work. But what I'm yeah. saying is that there, you still have an element from the Muslim community that has a lot of anger and resentment, whether that's from mm. leftist progressive Muslims or from even, you know, traditional Muslims. Um, so you don't think that's, that's just problem. to do with immaturity? what is it where is that it's it's they, political as well right like it's politi yeah, there's a huge political element um yeah and you know i i'm sure they want what's best for the muslim community um but the strategies that they're using is just it's like one step forward and 10 steps back i mean you know like I, you know i saw one tweet of them was just like it was like a two square meme and the first meme was like kufar enters into world war right and then, you know, on the caption, it's like a guy saying, oh, that's a shame. And then the second frame was like, ah, oh, so whatever, uh, you know, what, you know, what's for dinner? Like, it's just, 
disgusting. Like, and you know, like, yes, yes. And these people are getting thousands of likes and thousands of fault people following them, you know, and you know, a yeah. lot of these people who are following oh, them, they just ignore, you know, things like that and just concentrate on the, the good work they, that they do do. But the problem with that is that, Oh God, a law forbid if, you know, like non-Muslims actually see that. I mean, you know, and to yeah. them, it doesn't I remember, matter. To... I remember there was something going on where Muslims was like talking about white tears, you know, mm -hmm. and and that that's what really ups that upset me. You know, like when I was uh, online, I was thinking, gosh, you know, how de dehumanizing, right? Like yeah. to see uh, somebody crying and then w the only thing you have to say is white tears, you know, yeah. Yeah. like and, you know, that sort me... of thing, right? Yeah, and let me put it this way, Fatima. Let's say you joined a bowling league, right? So you joined a bowling league of like, and it's all, you know, white and British, you know, people, right? And you're like, oh yeah, welcome to this bowling league. You know, like, you know, they're very welcoming and stuff. And, you know, you know, like half of them are great. You know, they you know, they think you're wonderful. Maybe everyone says, you know, like, it's we're so glad to have you here. Uh, but then like, you know, 10, 20% of them, you know, you find online that they're they're tweeting about how much they hate muslims or how much they hate indians right like how would that make mm -hmm. you feel you know you know like would you feel that like you to do with the left that, that is to do with the left though that is 100 percent to do with the because at the moment the left's whole rhetoric you know obsession with race obsession with um in a way with collectivization right um how is your what you're advocating different to the 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 kind of identity politics that the left advocates well i mean again to a large extent i can understand where they're coming from i mean you know muslim countries have been completely destabilized and bombed by western foreign policy um you know many europeans never wanted these wars we never wanted you know to destabilize the yeah, middle east absolutely um you know and it's the reason why uh you you see muslims immigrating to the west and you know, like you can't blame them for that. I mean, they have no choice, um, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, on top of that, there is a the anti-Islam, you know, liberal faction uh, that has, you know, those are the ones, those are the people protesting at mosques. Those are the ones spray painting graffiti. Those are the ones stabbing our du'at. So this anger that the left and both left and traditionalists, some traditionalist Muslims have towards the Anglosphere to a large extent is very understandable. What we're saying is that we have a solution to that. The best solution for us as European descendant converts is that we have to give dawah to our own people um, because those are the pe those people protesting at, at mosques, those people who are joining the EDL, those people who are, you know, like vandalizing masjids, yeah. those are our aunts, yeah. those are our uncles. Um, yes. And it should be our collective responsibility to lead the charge um, in changing their hearts and minds about Islam, you know, so, and that's not an easy thing to do. You know, like it's a lot of these white converts, they convert to Islam and they become like this quote unquote anti-racist, but they end up, you know, becoming this white savior in the process and just start saying that, you know, all white people are just collectively irredeemably evil, um, you know, which is not the right approach because there's a lot of people in the Anglosphere who have no problem with, with Muslims and actually admire, you know, what is, what Muslims are doing. But in a lot of these white converts, they, in order to fit in, they have to be even, they try to act even more uh, extreme uh, in order to try yeah. to fit in with the greater Muslim community. And it's, but isn't, isn't that just part, part of the journey as well? Because like, I remember there was a time when this is, this is completely wrong. You know, like when, when somebody would convert, they would be told you've got to leave your spouse you've got to you know like basically um change your name yeah here's a new set of clothes <laughs> you know um and now i think slowly things are changing like most converts the new ones that i'm seeing they're not changing their names which is good there's no reason to change your name right mm -hmm. um the Sahaba were converts, right? They never changed their names mm. unless they had a bad meaning, right? Mm. Um, also, they're kind of not, they're, they're being warned as well. Like converts are generally being told, you know, don't take things too quickly. You know, don't do things too quickly. Don't impose things on your family mm. slowly, slowly, because a lot of the earlier converts, like from the, you know, last few decades before um they tended to go in with a sledgehammer right like with their families and 
yeah. uh, show themselves show a lot of hatred towards their previous culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, but now they're being kind of encouraged not to do that. You know, there's no need for that. So I feel like slowly the 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 kind of culture is changing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, those are all steps in the right direction, Fatima. Like, I'm not disparaging yeah. those um, opinions yeah, at yeah. all. I think mm -hmm. they're all really, you know, I'm not, you know, like, um, alhamdulillah, that, that's great that they're, you know, advocating for that. Um, but like I said before, it's necessary, but not sufficient. Um, still, even with all that advice, you still have to deal with your non-Muslim family. Um, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, that's why a lot of Westerners are, admire islam and they you know like they think it has a lot of truth to it and they would convert to islam um but the fallout that would uh, incur um would not um and, and you know the you have a muslim community that's not ready to deal with that fallout um and for good reason too i mean the, the resources you would need would be astronomical but they don't just don't convert to islam in the first place um and that's if we had a european muslim sub community um that addressed those issues um, you would see a lot more Westerners not only converting to Islam, but but staying in Islam. And overall, the opinion or attitudes on Islam uh, would change uh, uh, pretty much overnight. Um, like you take a look, you know, like what we're advocating for is, let's say you go to Bu to Romania, like you visit Bucharest in Romania. Um, you know, you go to an I4E chapter and it's completely run by Romanian converts. Um, the iftars, the food is Romanian. Uh, the, the traditional dress is, you know, what their ancestors used to wear, even if it's just for Eid or Juma prayer. Um, they have their own marriage networks. Um, when, you know, um, I guess Europeans have questions about Islam, they can be referred to that masjid. They're still interacting with the greater Muslim community, just like all these Muslim subcultures have done in the West. Um, but, you know, they have uh, specific needs to address. Uh, and then, you know, once they intermarry and they have kids and their kids have their kids, then you'll see the attitudes towards Islam uh, change in the in the Anglosphere. I, I guarantee it. Um, you know, and then that's that's what really needs okay, to happen. Okay, but you're you're not married to a convert, so uh, this is the thing that I don't fully understand. Like, are you saying let's make the uh, the uh, atmosphere conducive to people doing yep. that and and yeah. for it to survive and thrive? You can't is force people. Saying? Yeah, you you're can't not force saying, people to because, marry because each other. brother brother Robert, you know even without islam people are marrying intermarrying in you know like britain is a me. very multicultural community right like right but that's an option but again we don't, marriages. we don't have the option uh, oftentimes of marrying right. so you're saying culture. let's make it let's make it easier let's make it possible for people to do that you're not saying let's yeah. sort of force people to or encourage people that they have to do that no, you can't force people to to <laughs> to marry one person to the other. But I talked yeah, to a lot of these converts who ended up marrying a born Muslim and ended in, in divorce. And I asked them, like, had you if you converted to Islam and there was already a community of, of converts from the same background, would you have married you know a convert from that background? They just said, yeah, in a heartbeat, it would have been a lot easier. Let's be, let's face but that's, that's going to happen, isn't it? Like in a few generations, that's going to take a few generations, uh, brother Robert. I feel like, I feel like almost this generation. Okay, yeah. you, you're talking to people who who, <laughs> who whose marriage is ended, uh, but I've got people in my family whose marriages are thriving, right? In in that that setting, and, that, and in a way, it's actually helped them. You know, like to have that family that that was there was a, a ready-made family for them to come home to um well to have I mean, a different culture to have and obviously their children are mixed uh, heritage as well uh, that they don't see that as a as a negative or you know so what i'm trying to say they, is that i guess there's people with different experiences and maybe the first generation of converts or the early generations of converts which i feel like exists today are going to have to go through that difficult uh, process, and definitely in a few generations, um, it's going to naturally happen anyway. You know that marriage between, uh, you know, people of the same heritage is going to become easier, just because the pool of converts and the pool of people is greater. 
Well, yeah, again, these are sensitive topics. And you know, if it were if hey, if, if that marriage works for them, then that's fine. But for the vast majority of Westerners who are interested in Islam, if they were to marry even someone, you know, outside of the same culture, their families would be like, get out of here and we never want to talk to you again. It would just be complete cut off. So really? Oh, absolutely. Are you sure I, that's I mean, not a Canadian thing? <laughs> Seriously, because well, maybe I'm I'm seeing things through London a Londoner's eyes, you know. London is very very multicultural very well i, I have you again, ever been to london no i've never been to london unfortunately i live in london but it's london ontario <laughs> yeah again again uh, what i'm saying is that um you know like if you have an environment where it's more conducive where you can marry from the same culture um it's a lot you see people converting to islam en masse and staying and also you know the non-muslim family or commute the non-muslim community generally their attitudes towards islam become better and, you yeah know, I, I can see that for rural community. even in the uk i can see that for rural areas mm. right. in the big cities um in the towns it's really become quite normal for i mean i don't know if you saw the olympics in in britain right when when the olympics came to london the de facto like the you know they have the opening ceremony mm -hmm when they represented you know, like the typical British person, it was a mixed race person, you know, because like Britain really has become that kind of melting pot. Well, uh, I mean, and also the younger generation, like our generation, we, we do of heritage Muslims. We're also kind of figuring out our, or we have figured out a new British culture of our own, right? Like we're not literally just following our parents' culture. We don't like Indian desserts, right? Like we like in we eat mince pies and we like our chocolate eggs, and we also like it, traditional English food, right? Um, although you know Indian food is like the most popular food in Britain at the moment, but anyway, that's another that's another story. Um, what what i'm trying to say is that there is a new emerging identity right which is very british british muslim identity um which has elements of our previous cultures or our parents cultures but it also embraces our britishness uh and you don't really get to see that maybe on the internet you know especially amongst the Dais, uh, certain popular Dais, but I definitely feel it's there. Like my children are very British in many ways, you know, like they, in terms of their tastes, um, definitely in their clothing, you know, um, in what they consider to be fun, what they consider to be normal is very European and very British. So, I'm just looking at it from a from a the bigger picture of like both convert communities and also uh, you know heritage Muslims and how actually there's almost like a merging that's happening anyway you know in in the newer generations of a new emerging culture which is not going to be as you know is not going to induce as much animosity I feel. Well, uh, I mean, and again, that's perfectly alhamdulillah that that you're, you know, that that Muslims in, in Europe are creating this, uh, you know, like uh, integrated culture, um, you know, and, you know, and we're not trying to um, exclude uh, other Muslims or throw them under the bus uh, when we're advocating for yes. these for these things. Mm. So we would never advocate, you know, for Muslims to be harmed, uh, you know, living in Europe. Um, what I'm saying is that you do agree that there is a lot of animosity towards Islam uh, in Europe. And that's why a lot of them enjoy these, you know, um, anti-Islam right groups. Um, I mean, the, I mean, you kind of, I mean, I'm not, I've never been in Europe proper, but I mean, I'm sure they're there and they're, it's, it's a problem. Um, but don't but, you think that's, that's ironic though, that you are called Islam for Europeans and you haven't, into Europe like uh, I'm, I'm I'm just saying like don't you think that it might be good to come to Europe well I know the to do a bit I, need, to do, I would need to, if you to want to give me the money to go, be great. yeah <laughs> no I, I, I mean this sincerely brother like I'm not I'm not like 
Well, I know, would love to. I'm just saying that since you are speaking for Europeans, right? Like as in European heritage people, I think it would be really good. I think it should be part of your work to uh, to come I'm, to Europe, to travel, to to actually see what's going on. Because I've been to Canada and there are parts of Canada that felt, like you said, very, you know, mus- there were there were hardly any mosques, there were hardly any Muslims at all, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Europe's not like that, especially the, the the bigger cities, and you know, Britain is not even a very big country, really. Um, we have people in office in the various at various levels that are Muslims, you know. So there's a certain level of normalization. I'm not saying that there isn't animosity, but definitely on the streets, the NHS is basically run by you know like immigrants right like so many people of different backgrounds a lot of muslim doctors and nurses uh so i don't know like i feel like part of your work should be to come to europe to spend time with uh you know converts and heritage muslims of different backgrounds here to see what it's really like because television and the news and even the internet are not really good representations of how how things are. Well, I, well, first of all, I don't have them. I, if, I, if someone were to give me the money to go to Europe and, and see it, I mean, I would be I would be glad to. I mean, I just I'm living hand to mouth right now, <laughs> and you know, I'm in a lot of oh, student yeah, loan debt. I mean, um, also, but, but do you know how how Malcolm I, X did that? Didn't he? Right. Like, don't you think? Do, do you see like his journey to Africa? Right. His whole journey to uh, like basically traveling the world yeah. completely changed his perspective, right? Because I, well, I it understand has a big, we it have has a big of, impact. We have a lot of members. Uh, in fact, almost all of our members live in are European Muslims in Europe. So you know, like the mm-hmm. I mean, it's not just me. I mean, like I, yes, I, yes. I I'm the face of the organization, but you know, like uh. You know, like they. But I think they should help you to be able to do that. Then, <laughs> but again, we're not. Should... I'm not just going off the, what we see on social media. I mean, this. You know, I've been Muslim for 18 years, and I've dealt with so many different Muslim organizations here. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, and I've talked to you know many Muslims who converts who've been in the game for you know longer than I have, and they reiterate the same things that I'm saying. Uh, that you know, it's it's a very big problem that you know, like. Uh, converts are just entering into a just a really bizarre field um and you know they're just the moths are just not they don't have the the tools uh, to the to address their issues and when they do they end up spending more money than end up getting wasted um and you know like if you were to implement this idea not only would it be a lot cheaper uh but it would also be more effective uh in the long run but you're so, assuming that people will because I, I I don't see what you're saying as controversial. Actually, I mean, I, I'm, I'm I just think you're you're asking for it to be a more organized effort, and I I mm. kind of see it as happening kind of organically anyway. Do you see like, uh, but w- what I want to ask you is why do you think doing it in an organized and as you call it collectivist way, why do you feel that that will be even seen because if you think about most non-Muslims, right, everyone is in their own echo chambers, right? Like, especially online. If they if they d- haven't discovered a, a positive Muslim community already, why do you think they would discover a, a, a European heritage community? And do you see what I mean? Like, Well, I mean, it's not just about, you know, creating these, you know, uh, brick and mortar uh, edifices. Um, it's about changing the, the the whole game about how we, you know, think about giving Islam uh, in Europe, basically. Um, and you know, like, because um, I, 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 you know, I, I had an interview with Dr. Edward Dutton uh, uh, last week or okay. a couple of weeks ago, and you know, it, 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 um, you know, this is this is a crowd that like you know never really talks to Muslims, and I don't. Do you know who Dr. Edward Dutton is, or? No, no, I don't. Sorry, yeah. I don't. I don't know much about him. Yeah, so I mean, this is he's you know, a non-Muslim. He's a researcher, and you know, like he's on the. I guess you could say, like, on the European right. But his okay. attitudes towards Islam are more positive uh, than the average bear, right? Okay. So, um, 
so you know like but he 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 actually wrote a book on islam but it had so many different errors in it um i guess the basics he got right but the controversial issues he actually thought that this is what muslims actually believe and practice like fgm and um you know forced marriages and um you know like honor killings but he was taking that and putting instead of you know criticizing it he was like putting a positive spin on it from an evolutionary perspective um so I, I went on the interview just to clear a lot, up a lot of these misconceptions because this crowd never talks to Muslims. Muslims just aren't mm. reaching out. Um, it's great so this, that you did that. It's great, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you know, That's like, forward. yeah, I mean, uh, but the thing is, you know, they don't get any, these people, you know, don't get any screen time. They're completely unknown. I mean, this is a, an, uh, people who, who watch his videos among that group. I mean, you know, this is, um, these are people who have varying attitudes about about Islam, but and you know again a lot of people had negative reactions to me being on a show, but other people thought, thought it was great, uh, you know that I went on and everything, and you know like we're seeing a lot of Muslims who support our idea completely. Um, that you know uh, European converts to Islam should collectivize and keep everything about them, and you know form an organized group and have an organized collective mindset and change. The whole mentality about Islam within the Anglosphere, um, and they think this absolutely needs to happen. And then the, the 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 a lot of the feedback from you know this particular group on the European right has been overwhelmingly positive. Um, so it, it's what it's does collectivization uh, just to just for people who might be listening and you know you've you when you say collectivization, like can you give us some examples like tangible examples of what that looks like yeah just go to any any city in the west i mean like for example here in london you know um you know we have it's got a pretty large muslim community um but when you you mean you're london right yes london ontario sorry Sorry. london ontario yeah okay yep uh just naturally you know muslims it's a big muslim community here and when you go to eid prayer you see all the muslims you know uh praying together um, at the same time, you know, you have the Bosnian uh, Islamic Center, uh, yep. you know, which is for the, you know, run by the Bosnian community. You have um, Arab uh, markets, uh, you know, and, and you know, like Arabs will go there even if they're on the other side of the neighborhood and there's another Pakistani butcher shop like right next to them. Uh, you know, and the people just, the people are social creatures. They just have a natural affinity for people based on language, culture, um, nationality. Um, and, you know, like, as long as you're not um, denigrating other Muslims or, you know, thinking that you're better than them, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And you see yeah. this in Toronto as well. Like, I went to an Eid prayer in Toronto outside, uh, and it was run by this mosque that was run completely by Somalis. And 95% yeah. of the congregation was Somali. A block north of that was a mosque that was run by Pakistanis doing their <laughs> Eid prayer. And the Jama'a was 95% Pakistani. And the Imam for the Somali mosque, he was like, you know, this is haram. You know, we should be, you know, all praying in one, you know, as one Jama'a. You know, like he was getting mad at like the other group. And I'm just thinking, me and my friend looked at each other like, <laughs> why, why aren't you doing this? You know, <laughs> like, you know, this is, I think what we see now is that um, uh, there's this, sometimes we, as a Muslim community, we conflate natural affinity for people based on one's culture and language or other, you know, uh, things with disunity in the Ummah. And I think this yeah, that's is, true. that's true. My, my husband goes to a Somali mosque sometimes and, uh, th- there's no problem. Yeah, you're right. Like, it's just basically those like basically people from that community got together set up something right uh made sure that the khutbas were in their language right so that they could have that that feeling of um community i guess um yeah. it doesn't mean that they're excluding others Pe- people are welcome to come and enjoy somali food and <laughs> um you know their culture as well and there's not like a they're not ex- excluding people who are not Somali. It's just exactly. so happens that they collectively set it up, right? Yeah. And so it does have a certain, what you could call a certain character to it, yeah? Like a distinctly Somali character to it. Right. 
but yeah. my husband loves going to pray there so it doesn't mean it doesn't mean uh so so do you think people get a bit threatened when they see european heritage people doing the same thing is that what you Oh, absolutely. I mean, think about it. Yeah. We have to, I have to watch as a front man for Islam for Europeans. I have to watch every word that I say, um, you know, like uh, I have to be very clear about, you know, uh, that we're not trying to exclude other people or trying to be some sort of uh, white supremacist group. Meanwhile, a lot of these other organizations, no one, that's an eyelash, you know, like Islam and Spanish, you know, they got an official endorsement from Yasser Qadi and Omar Suleiman. And, and that's great, but I can't imagine either of those you know, respected brothers supporting us. I mean, they would be deplatformed, you know, in a second. But 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 what the what's the difference? The difference is they're talking about a language. Not necessarily. I mean, the Islam and Spanish does serve important functions for converts of from a Latino uh, background. And again, like there's still animosity towards Islam, you know, within the Latino sphere. Um, but Islam and Spanish they're willing to talk to their non muslim the, the converts family and community to allay their fears and when you know you have someone from the same background um it's a lot more efficient and able to address their issues and uh help them you know, help the converts survive um so that's one thing and i mean even if you know putting islam and spanish aside you know the pudding is in the proof whenever Muslims have followed this idea of allowing the converts to collectivize into a cohesive group. Um, the results have just been enormously positive. I mean, you know, they not only convert to Islam en masse, but they stay. Um, and, uh, you know, like the... even Where, where have you seen that? Uh, everywhere. The Zulu Muslims in South Africa. For the longest time in South Africa, as you know, the overwhelming majority of Muslims there uh, were from a South Asian background. Um, so they never even reached out to you know other you know uh tribes in, in south africa you know if you converted to islam you basically had to take on the south asian culture like you had to drop the dress and dress like a, a south asian um you know you have to wear a shawar kameez and, and a topi um you have to eat spicy food so a lot of like when they try to give dawah to the zulus the zulus are like yeah we don't want to if we convert to islam we, we don't like spicy food uh you know we'd have to change the way you know we dress and that's too hard for us because our families the way our families would react they would completely reject us there's a good sheikh that i talked to his name is ismail kamdar he's in south africa and oh yeah he yeah. addressed this yeah he addressed this issue and he said look like you know the zulus you know they need to have their own collective zulu muslim identity um and uh, once they implemented that and the zulus actually created their own community center then you saw the zulus convert to islam en masse and Umar um, Farouk Abdullah, mm. he talked about this in Islam and the cultural imperative. It's just like, yeah, like they can convert to us, you know, they, you know, like, you know, we should respect that the Zulus are going to convert to Islam, but they're going to remain Zulus and they're going to be great Muslims. Um, and uh, that's, I think, is what's missing with a, a, a lot of dawah, not just in the Anglosphere, but, you know, in non-Muslim communities at large, because um, oh, when we saw the spread of Islam through the world, you know what would happen was those people you know they would the people giving dawah would give dawah to the chief you know the the heads of state and the chieftains and they would convert to islam and then as a result you know their uh subjects you know they would convert to islam as well so basically those groups converted to islam en masse so quickly mm -hmm. to the point where you know the muslims in that region the overwhelming majority were from that region and they basically you know um the 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 duats or the people who came to spread Islam, they be actually became the minority within the Muslim community within a couple of years. So you saw this, they were That's able gonna to happen. Of their culture. I think that is going to happen. That's I mean, not what we're seeing. Fast slowly. Like, like, no, I mean, well, it's just because it's just because Asians have so many kids probably that well, you're not seeing well, Fatima, it. Look at it this way. Like, let's take Ch Chatham, Ontario, for example, right? It's 43,000 people. It's 95% uh, white. The whole Muslim community there is, um, there was a South Asian Diobandi uh, community that opened up their own mosque there in an all white town. All of the congregants yeah. there wear South Asian clothing, uh, mm -hmm. shalwar kameez, the whole deal. And all the women wear black niqabs. Um, mm -hmm. And they have, they don't have anyone there convert to Islam because it's just such, so completely it's seen cultural. as a, such a separate, separate thing. Yeah. yeah. It's just, and it's just not conducive. And it got, you know, to the point where even the Arabs from, 
you know, in Chatham, Arab Muslims in Chatham, they ended up forming their own mosque on the other end of the city. And this is a city of only 42,000 people where you have less than 100 yeah. Muslims. So even other Muslims from other cultural backgrounds didn't even said, you know, we need to open up our own thing. Even they felt they needed more. And, yeah. Space. And yeah. the imam, who was from a Palestinian background, I had the chance to talk to him. And I talked to him, I started talking to him about, you know, trying to give dawah to the people in Chatham. And he's like, he said flat out, people don't like us here. And then I'm like, look, I've been Muslim for 15 years. Like, I know what I'm talking about. Like, not everybody hates Islam. Like, there's some people who don't have a negative impression of Islam. And he's, he's like very few. And this is a person mm. who just doesn't interact with the Anglosphere. So exactly, I, yeah. I know you're talking about mm. large organizations like AIRA, uh, where they're very integrated and they want to reach out to the greater non-Muslim community. And that's wonderful. But unfortunately, Fatima, that's not what we're seeing on the ground, especially <laughs> cities outside of large metropolitan Not areas. Not even organizations. I, I feel like in Britain anyway, as a community, uh, Muslims are opening up way more. You know, like the, the, it's just much more... Like I don't know if you've seen. Wait, before I say that, I want to say I want to acknowledge that what you've just said is it really you know resonates because I I don't know if you heard my conversation with Yoram uh, and I was talking about this letter that I got from a from a um, non-Muslim elderly lady and uh, how she she spoke about how she feels that her community has changed overnight and. She doesn't feel she could speak to Muslims, you know. Uh, that that's exactly what you're kind of describing, right? Like yeah. because of the way Muslims tended to ghettoize, right? Mm -hmm. And that could be, you know, internal as well as externally imposed, I guess. Um, but also the way that Muslims sometimes have not reached out and have not made the extra effort to make people feel more welcome and uh, encourage them to understand you know mutual understanding etc she felt very um she felt this animosity she felt she said my country's changed overnight um i feel like it's gone backwards when it comes to women's rights when i see a woman dressed you know like in a veil um so all of those things that she was expressing um i i could actually empathize with um and i and i really felt probably because I've grown up with non-Muslims, you know, like all, all my school life, um, mm. I can kind of empathize with with their families. And I remember one of my friends at school, her her mom said to her, you know, don't don't be friends with a girl like her, like me. Yeah. She she said to her, you know, don't don't make friends with her because we don't really understand what kind of background she's from, you know. But then I had friends whose moms were so happy that their daughters were with were my friend because they knew they wouldn't go drinking and exactly. you know no boyfriends and stuff. So we'd have good good clean fun. So I mean, I, I feel like this the the wider community has slowly been grappling with this change, this immense and very rapid change that's happened. You know, some people are more open to change. Some people are not as Muslims, we should be reaching out. We should be like, I, I, I love the Ramadan tent project here in the UK, for example. You know, these 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 projects that really kind of welcome in like my dad, he's he's organizing a, a a community iftar just out in the out in the open in on his street. And he's just, you know, inviting everybody. Those things are all kind of way better than what's what what does happen in some communities which is like you said you know uh people keeping to themselves uh completely being different to the wider community uh but i think i think one of the things i guess i'm trying to get at is it's it's changing slowly and organically uh, the the immigrant community themselves have been grappling with identity who are we, you know, which aspects well, of this culture it, can we adopt and which can't we? Uh, and slowly, I feel like we're, I, I definitely feel very comfortable as a British Muslim. Um, I feel very British. I have no real connection with India, you know, um, in the sense that, of course I do, I have relatives, you know, but I mean, I've hardly ever been there, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like, 
slowly but surely the culture and the openness of the community is changing. And so shouldn't we be uh, encouraging the entire community to just become way more open? Won't that be more effective? Well, again, a lot of, I mean, some people in the Muslim community, they, you know, they have legitimate uh, grievances and fears and they don't, they don't want to, uh, and they're just terrified of even, you know, uh, you know, reaching out and, and talking to, the, to these people and vice versa. I mean, it's, it's just, it, it's just natural. And, and, you know, like I said, the work that, that you guys are doing, like the tents and everything, that's wonderful. I mean, that, that's a lot better than, you know, the kind of like the ghettoized, um, you know, what's happening on with, uh, with Muslims living in like these, you know, in like, uh, you know, self-segregated communities. Um, but it's still a problem. I think it's because you're at an earlier stage as well. Well, Canada, I mean? Like, yeah, I mean, Canada. You're probably is, Britain a few decades back. Yeah. Well, I, and I don't want, again, I don't want mm. Canada to turn into another Britain in the sense that, you know, there's this growing animosity between Islam and the and the Anglosphere. I mean, think about it this way. Let's say, you know, we may, may make, make up this, um, you know, like, um, you know, like fantasy uh, European country, you know, out of the top of our heads, you know, like Muslims go there and there's already an existent European Muslim population, like let's say 10% of the population uh, who already have, who are already Muslim and, you know, like they've integrated everything from their culture into this, you know, Muslim community that they've created. Wouldn't that that would mean that, you know, there would be a lot less animosity towards Islam as opposed to saying if there was nobody there from that community who, you know, who was Muslim. Um, I'll give you another example. Lithuania is the only country in Europe that has a halal meat council that's uh, supported by their government. And that is because the Muslim community in Lithuania is either, they're either indigenous Lithuanians or uh, they're taters who have, you know, stayed there for centuries. So they've, assimilated into the Lithuanian culture, you know, to the point yeah. where even other European countries that have large Muslim populations, they actually have to import halal meat from Lithuania. Uh, so, you know, since the, this, this small Muslim community has been able to, you know, like represent Islam within their culture, um, that's been, it's been a lot easier process for them. So yeah. um, I think it takes, but again, it takes time. You know, I just I just see it getting worse. Probably Honestly, generations. Fatima, I, I see it getting worse unless we change the game. I see it, I see it getting worse. I don't see it getting any better. Uh, a lot of these cities, like you know Windsor and, and Chatham, I mean, they're not taking in new converts. Uh, Westerners are just too. They're just not conducive to go there, and they're just not going to be ready to address uh, their issues unless you have converts who are willing to do one of three things: either completely assimilate into the Muslim community change the way they dress, change the way they talk, change the way they act uh, to marry into a Muslim family, which, hey, if it works for them, it works for them. But I mean, that's not going to be the case for a lot of people who are interested in Islam. Uh, and three, um, you know, become like this kind of anti-racist white savior crusader type. Um, apart from those three options, I mean, it's very difficult to There is another survive. option. What is that? And that is to encourage the entire Muslim community to become more open, to, to be okay with being Canadian. To, like, Fuck. like, like we're adv advocating be okay with being British. I think it took some of our ulama actually here in the UK, especially for the more conservative communities. Yeah. People like Sheikh Haytham, et cetera, to actually say, you know what, we're, you're British, you're British Muslims and be proud of being British. Being British is good. You know, uh, because there was like, I remember there was a whole time when, especially conservative Muslims, they were like, they were just waiting to leave, you know, like they were trying to make hijra, so-called hijra. And, you know, if they couldn't, then they were living in these kind of very separate lives. And it took, I feel like it took ulama, it took leaders and, you know, people from within the community to say, uh, actually, you know, we're British, we're here to stay we we're part of the fabric of this society and i think until the wider even if you do create collectivist uh you know convert communities until the the majority of muslims which is basically non 
uh, European heritage, right? Uh, until they open up and start becoming more open and becoming more inclusive, it's it's always they're always going to be seen as a, you know, as a fifth column. I'm not trying to sound all doom and gloom here, Fatima. I mean, there's a lot of positivity, you know, going on within, you know, Muslim um, organizations that are doing great work. Uh, but mm. the fact remains is that there's a lot of animosity between uh, Islam and the Anglosphere. And I don't see it getting any, I see it getting worse. Um, and, you know, like, give me, let me give you an example. Abdul Hakim Marat got into hot mm. water in his latest book, uh, Coming Home, or uh, when he said that he wanted Muslims to feel quote unquote sympathy uh for indigenous Europeans because of what has happened to their country. He got into hot water for saying that. I mean, you know, he was canceled out. And I'm just not thinking really. like he's not in hot water. He's he's too he's too big to be in hot water. Like th this is this is why I, I, I do feel that look, I know there is a vocal minority that really are really annoying and really like quite racist as well towards white people as well, right? Um but when you're actually experiencing it on the ground, it's really not as dramatic. Like, I, I you know, uh, Abdul Hakim Murad has a mosque, right? Uh, or he set up a mosque, the Cambridge Mosque, uh, Eco Mosque. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a wonderful example of a model mosque, right? Like, it's literally a British, a European mosque. Like, yeah. the way it's designed, the technology that's gone into it, the thought that's gone into it. Okay, it has Turkish elements, it has Arab elements, etc. But it's a very modern British mosque. Um, it's an eco mosque. I mean, come on, you know, like, you can't get more modern than that. Like it literally uh, reuses its own like rainwater and you know stuff like that. You know, and and the air circulation and it's, it's complicated stuff, but it's very uh, sophisticated. And he's obviously. Uh, consulted with the community, set this up. The designers, the the architects of the mosque were all like Westerners, right? I think it was actually a Jewish, Jewish uh, architect, um, some of the best architects in Europe. And that community is amazing. The way, I mean, I, I, ju I just visited a few, my, my relatives actually, one of my relatives is the imam of the mosque, he's Bosnian. And... Um, Subhanallah, just going there, I saw so many convert forget converts, non-Muslims. I saw so many non-Muslims just coming to the mosque, just walking around, just loving the atmosphere. And I don't think that could have been created. I think what was beautiful about it is that it is multicultural. Like, I guess it took a visionary like Abdul Hakim, right? Uh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim to, to be able to kind of see what kind of mosque he'd like to see in Britain, right? Like a very open, very inclusive, very modern mosque, but at the same time, very traditional in its Islamic approach. Uh, it, it definitely takes visionaries, but without the support of the entire community and their openness, I don't think it could have been a reality. And I don't know. I just I seeing seeing a mosque like the Cambridge Mosque, it makes you feel very positive actually about the future. And I I don't see things getting worse, actually. I see it the opposite. I can see literally things are getting better. Well uh, in Britain, I, things are I, definitely getting better. Well, hey, the, the, the eco mosque in Cambridge is is a wonderful idea. Um, and you know, like like I said, these are all steps in the in the right direction i mean they they have i think you know they're on they're definitely uh, on the right track and they spent enormous amount of money uh trying yep, to you know definitely include more you know to be more inclusive and you need the money of the heritage of the muslim community you know what well, i mean like, the other that's another thing, that, right? well okay well again a lot of like i said a lot of these mosques are outside of you know these major metropoles are just running on shoestring budgets um so it's, yeah. the eco mosque is great but to implement it into every city in the west they were just not going to have the funding a lot a much cheaper model would be uh you know to have a chapter like islam for europeans 
uh, just take an old abandoned church that's just sitting there and just yep. refurbish it. We have uh, loads of those as well. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, yeah. and, you know, that should be the center. I mean, a mosque doesn't have to have any shape. I mean, I know you're talking about Yoram about, uh, you know, like the anti-Islam, right? You know, they're, they're mm. an, you know, they want to get rid of like minarets. Well, you don't yeah. need a minaret you don't have to have, have a, a mosque. I and mean, that's, you know, you don't have to make that's it true. look like an Arab mosque. If you look at the mosques in China, like in Xi'an, China, they look like Chinese temples. You know, there's yeah, no Arab. Yeah. I mean, apart from the Arabic uh, calligraphy in some of the uh, of the mosque, it looks completely like a Chinese temple. Um, you know, yeah, so, I agree. I agree. Definitely. That, so that's, yeah. that's similar to the whole kind of you have to change your name. You have to change your, you know, your clothing thing. Right. Yeah. Like, well, you don't have to. And a, a simple building, a beautiful, simple building can be a mosque. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the these are all great steps forward, and I'm not trying to sound all doom and gloom. And I think that, you know, Aira and Abdul Hakim Rad are doing wonderful work. Uh, yeah. I just think that, you know, there's a final step, you know, that's beyond the Overton window that they can't really talk about, but is so simple that it would just solve all these problems for everyone involved, non-Muslims, uh, Muslims on the European right, uh, converts to Islam, and born Muslims living in Europe, it would be a win, 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 win for everybody. Uh, and that is that the collectivization of European descendant converts, uh, you know, and, you know, that way we can incorporate, you know, everything in our traditional culture while still remaining part of the greater uh, Muslim community. Um, and, you know, that old lady who received that letter from, I mm. mean, it's just, so I mean that's great that she reached out to you, but there's a lot of people who have really negative opinions toward Islam and mass immigration in general. Um, that they'll never yeah. write you. That they'll that they're they're never you're never going to be able to reach these people. But, but their view their view one. won't change, only due to collectivism. Do you see what I mean? Their view will change through a multi-faceted approach, right? Like because yeah. because the fundamental change through immigration, whether it's from Muslims or non not non-muslims there's plenty of immigration from non-muslims as yes. well um that fundamental change is there you know so to a certain extent that community has to come to terms with it right uh yeah, so no i agree uh, and i guess what, one thing that's just popped out to me is yeah so uh I, I, first of all i think we shouldn't assume that just because there's criticism of like what you know uh for example, what Abdul Hakim said in his book, just because some people are criticizing, I, I feel like those are like the minority and certain certain people, their track record is so uh, solid. Yeah, they can't be canceled. You know, they've got such wide acceptance in the Muslim community, like in terms of from all backgrounds. So it doesn't necessarily represent what's actually happening. But also, isn't one of the problems that, when I say problems, I mean one of the, one of the things that maybe will stop uh, is not allowing this idea of yours to have maybe as much traction is that so, so many Muslims now converts have got heritage Muslim families, right. And relatives. And so for them, that kind of huge friction doesn't exist. Well, so, they, yeah, so, so, so obviously that. they, if your wife is, you know, from heritage Muslim backgrounds, like obviously their children are now also ha have got that mixed background. So they want their whole families and everyone to come along with them, right? Like on any journey that they go on. So, so that would make it difficult to, to well, collectivize. We're, well, we're not, again, we're not trying to denigrate them or, you know, make them feel excluded in any way. Um, you know, like, uh, you know, they went on a particular path. Uh, they chose that path. And, you know, who am I to to, to, to stop them? Uh, but what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, accepting Islam as the truth is, is one thing. But accepting it and actually joining a Muslim community, all these ingredients have to be right. And usually that is a combination of your family, you know, as accepting of not just you converting to Islam, but marrying into a totally different culture um, and having a, you know, belonging to a, a, a mosque and Muslim community, you know, that takes you and ex accepts you as your brother. If that, if all those ingredients are right, alhamdulillah, that's great. But 
for the majority of, of Europeans, that's simply not the case. And it's just not feasible for them uh, to do any of these things. Um, and th that's, that's what's creating more and more barriers to entry. And that's great that these, you know, converts, you know, like, you know, were able to integrate into the Muslim community. Um, but that's simply not going to be the case, I think, for a lot of people who are going to be interested uh, uh, in Islam. So, you know, a lot of it is just, you know, having that option available uh, where you, mm. you grow Islam from the ground up uh, within the Anglosphere. Um, and, and, and that way... Do you, know, you think Islam... sometimes that you might be overstating this? I don't think so. I mean, the, the, if you look at the influence of, of... So in other words, I'm not saying that what you're saying is wrong. I'm saying... It's happening anyway in a very slow but sure way, right? And maybe allowing it to happen organically is going to be healthier and less, I don't know, confrontational and maybe easier as well. Like just allowing there to be like a collective, uh, you know, flourishing and growth and opening of the Muslim community. And then slowly as the numbers increase, there will almost inevitably be a a certain level of you know collective effort um on every community's part um do you think maybe that's what i mean like do you think you might be over stating it and i don't that's think i don't, I don't causes think pushback over, i don't think i'm overstating the problem at all i mean we have there's okay. so many factors at play here one is that um you know and i don't want to talk about media but again it's huge i mean the these left us you know Muslims by name, you know, who get onto, you know, mainstream media. This is the face, you know, of the Muslim community that was never chosen by us traditionalist Muslims. But the fact remains, like, this is what non-Muslims see as, you know, the representatives of Islam. So they've probably never heard of people um, like Abdul Hakim Murat. I'm talking about your average yeah, white Western. Yeah, yeah. They, you but know, that's not going to change. Why, why do you think that would change through, through you know, because because that's because no a one's problem. traditional that's a problem Muslims of... are talking about it they're not they're not addressing this issue when ash sarkar says you know i'm a muslim and you know like at the same time says it's impossible to be racist to white people and traditional well, she's Muslims a communist don't so... and yeah, yeah but people still think that she's because she identifies as a muslim and okay, traditionalist yeah. muslims aren't addressing what she's talking about you know like so i mean but there will always be personalities who push themselves forward you know like as as the spokespeople for the various direct, things it, it, right it affects us converts directly because you know we have to deal with our non-muslim family and community and that's who they see as the face of islam so for people who are born into a muslim yeah. family they don't have to deal with this directly so you know they have all of their families muslim um, well, they we, have, have, we have to deal with the Islamophobia that results, I guess. Absolutely. No, no, yeah. I'm not denying mm. that at all. That is being a visible Muslim in the West is it must I can't I, I can't fathom how difficult that must be. I mean, you have to deal with that every day. You don't know who's going to be an Islamophobe on the street. It could be basically anybody. And then do, but it's also the media, day. brother Robert, it's the media. They're the ones who pick who gets to be on these programs. Yeah. It's not. It's not that the Muslim communities put these people forward, not at all, you know. No, you're it's right. Literally... So, I... so, so, the more Muslims that enter various spaces, right? Like at the moment, there's a there's a huge drive in Britain to to get Muslims into media, into all the different areas of society, right? The more Muslim representation there is, the more likely it is that they will suggest the right voices, you know. So. Um... I think one of the problems with that is tr traditionalist Muslims are going to have a very difficult time trying to enter into the into the mainstream media because their opinions don't really fit this liberal agenda. I mean, even who we consider as very moderate um, Muslims, you know, traditionalist mus Muslims who want to reach out to the greater non-Muslim community, even they're painted as extremists by the liberal uh, media. And I'll give you a perfect yeah. example of this is Numan Ali Khan. Um, Trevor Noah yeah. is scheduled to do a comedy show for Islamic Relief Canada. Um, and, you know, like he's going to be alongside Dalia Mogahed and Numan Ali Khan. And I, I saw an article in like this um, anti-Islam, you know, like a liberal conservative paper saying that Numan Ali Khan is like some sort of like ISIS extremist, you know, because he advocated that he said he didn't agree with, you know, homosexuality and things like that. So, um mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so, I mean, it, I, I don't mean to sound doom and gloom here, but it's going to be very difficult for traditionalist Muslims to enter into those spaces. And, and again, Trevor Noah, you know, has made a career out of like blasting the Anglosphere. And now Islamic Relief Canada is a mainstream Islamic organization. So I don't know who approved of him. And he's not a Muslim. So I don't know who approved of Trevor Noah doing a comedy show for this. The whole this is going to change like the whole narrative when have mainstream Islamic organizations, you know, pushing this idea that and people are going to look at it and go, yeah, you can disagree with his opinions on his opinions on Islam and the Anglosphere. But a lot of he's going to have an influence uh, yeah. and people are going to see that. So, so I think that's the that's the whole problematic relationship between Muslims and the left in general, right? Like that is being uh, that yeah. the people are grappling with. I think that's that's a whole other area that is important to that yeah. needs addressing, actually. And I th I feel like Muslims have gone too far with that. Uh, but I, I don't think it has to be so called traditionalist Muslims who who enter these spaces that will make a change, you know, like, I think, um, it can be the average Muslim who, I, who identifies and feels, you know, an affinity with Islam, um, is definitely gonna, even though it might be small changes, it's definitely gonna make changes. Um, if you just look at the example of, uh, Jordan Peterson, I feel like the fact that, so many Muslims were willing to engage with him, right? Um, and also meet him. And when they met him, they met him positively, right? Mm -hmm. In person and would suggest names like, you know, different different uh, Islamic scholars' names. And uh, I think that made it more likely and conducive to him actually making connections with Muslims, you know? Yeah. Um, and that, ha that it wasn't necessarily traditionalist Muslims who did that you know yep um so well i think yeah, everyone no. has a role to play slowly but surely i don't know i'm i'm seeing the shift very very slowly although it is towards uh a way more kind of uh inclusive and accepting and society and and i think that's on all of us you know like each and every one of us has a role to play in that like I, I don't think what you're what you're advocating is particularly con controversial. Um, I think it's it's going to happen anyway. Well, I mean, I think here's here's the thing. I, and again, these are all the the um, the work that uh, traditionalist Muslims and other regular Muslims have done. You know, giving dawah to the Jordan Peterson crowd is, I think, is wonderful work. And I'm not trying. You know, I think it's really positive, and uh, that's the kind of work that we need to be doing. Um, you know, I do think that um, many, I think the way that I think Jordan Peterson, he kind of acts as like, you know, he represents more like the the uh, liberal conservative, uh, you know, kind of crowd. But he's kind mm, of slowly getting away from that, whereas mm. the group, you know, that doesn't represent all of the uh uh, of the Anglosphere on the right by any means. In any case, um, I think that for us converts, the urgency, it's a lot more urgent situation, not only because, you know, um, uh, giving dawah to our own people may mean the difference between us being kicked out of our house or being able to stay, or may mean the difference between us being accepted by our family and being rejected. Uh, so there's, you know, I guess more, physiological, you know, more, our needs, you know, are more immediate in trying to, you know, like trying to get a foothold uh, and surviving you know, as converts, but also, you know, you know, we want our families to become Muslim as well. So, yes. I mean, the fact that it's going slowly, I mean, I, I understand that you, you know, you're trying to put a positive spin on it and that's wonderful that it's happening slowly, but surely, but you know, our families, you know, they're not going to live forever. They and need want, this urgently. They want them to, exactly. We mm. want them to convert to Islam. And when, you know, things are going slowly, quote unquote, slowly but surely, that's not good enough for us. Okay, so pa paint a picture for me. Paint a picture for me for, you know, like a what would be nice? Like what would be a nice transition for a convert from beginning to just just so that I could see like how it would be different. 
um, how you'd uh, like it to be. You go, okay, so. To make it conducive if, for the if, family. If I had millions of dollars and, you know, Islam for Europeans was able to establish like, you know, like centers everywhere, like the Tabliki Jamaat does, um, hmm. you'd have, a, even then we would start out small. We'd have like a small, yeah. you know, like um, uh, office space with the musallah in the back, uh, maybe like a game room. Uh, and it would be catered to converts from that from that area but muslims would be allowed to, to come there and pray there and you know we give them all their islamic rights but it's a, it's a place where a convert comes in or people maybe a non-muslim interested in islam um and you know we'd be able to ask them about you know you know they not only could we answer their questions about islam but help hopefully inshallah deal with the problems that they experience with their family maybe they have a family member who you know is willing to talk to muslims but not at a mosque or any Muslim environment, maybe at a neutral territory, maybe they'll be willing to do a phone conversation. Um, mm. You know, uh, you know, maybe they need, you know, like um, maybe that particular convert needs, you know, social services. So we get in, get them in touch with the people, you know, that are professionals uh, in that regard. But you know, that's and mosques are, you know, they refer these converts to us, so they don't have to keep draining their money and time and resources uh, mm -hmm. on them. So we're better able to do that. And, you know, you get converts who come in who had they gone to a mosque that was, you know, 95 percent, um, um, you know, like non, you know, born Muslim yeah. mm -hmm. that, you know, like they would have been kicked out of the house um, because their family didn't want to talk to Muslims or they didn't have any Muslims they, they can turn to. If you had this center, you know, we would have a whole team that may be able to you know, talk to their family or maybe able to just, you know, be mm. friends with them. So they're just by mere exposure, they now have a Muslim friend from the same background that is now interacting with their family, not maybe not even mentioning anything about Islam. So you may be able to prevent uh, them getting kicked out of the house. And that way the Muslim community doesn't have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars uh, providing room and board uh, for this person. And then once you have a community of like 50, 100, uh, you know, converts, uh, then you're able to, um, you know, grow that community from the ground up. Um, and then on top of that, the, you know, the rest of the non-Muslim community from that background, they see that Muslims are not, uh, a, Islam is not a cultural threat anymore because they see yes. the, the, the converts from that region adapting Islam into their traditional uh, cultures. So this doesn't just go for, you know, European descendant converts, but any country in the world or any place where there's Muslims there and they make up and they're a majority immigrant population or non-native population, they need to help converts from that region set this up so they can have their own um, centers and sub-communities. And that way, Islam will be seen as a universal cultural filter as opposed to, um, a, a, you know, an, a, a cultural uh, foreign invader. So... Hmm, that, that's that's a beautiful picture actually that you paint. Uh, you do, do you think that that could, uh, for the time being anyway, uh, could be set up as uh, like a department of current mosques? Well, I mean, there's no harm in trying. If we had the funds, absolutely. I mean, we would, you know, let's do a prototype model. Because I feel like that would be a good start. Yeah, like Jan from. Um, debating truth with Jan. I had a conversation with him a couple weeks ago and he's trying to implement the same thing in Slovakia. Uh, and it's a really rough go. And he said, yeah, like if we had the funds, we would totally set up an Islam for Europeans chapter where we would still be interacting uh, with the immigrant Muslim community. We'd be giving them all their Islamic rights, um, but that it would be catered to uh, Slovakian, the issues that Slovakian converts to Islam face and also the Slovak population you know, who has fears and resentments uh, towards Islam. So, you know, we can work on giving dawah to them. Uh, and then you foster an environment where it's a lot, not only are, you know, you're helping a Slovakian converts, but you're creating an environment that's more inducive to help Slovaks, um, you know, like learn more about Islam without seeing it as set of this, this sort of this uh, cultural threat. So. Alien culture, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I can, I can really see this starting as, because it has to start somewhere, right? Like, starting as a, a a department of a current mosque of current well efforts. i don't think that's that's gonna that's not gonna work because again a lot of 
uh, non-Muslims, they don't want to enter a mosque. It's enemy territory. Right, yeah. Even mm. for converts, a lot of converts don't want to enter a mosque. But what I mean is not physically. Out. I don't mean physically in the mosque. Mm. I mean financially supported by a mosque. Yeah, but we have to run it our way. I mean, uh, it'd have to be like mm. an office uh, and a completely, and it'd have to be a neutral third territory is what I'm saying. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's basically what needs to be done. And uh, it's very easily implementable. It's, it's you know, like this, you know, um, this can be done. It's very feasible. Um, it's just changing the mindset of people because now, you know, like it's, it's like I said, it's going to be very difficult the knee-jerk reaction is to reject this idea, uh, especially among traditionalist Muslims, because they see any type of thing like this as "quote unquote" creating division uh, within the Ummah. Um, you know, and I've had people tell me straight up. I've had converts, you know, who've been in the game for decades who say, you know, this is they can't get their heads around it. They think it's you know going to create division, "quote unquote" division, and become a cult. Go ahead. I was going to say that's where you have to play politics because yeah. I was thinking to myself, you know, sometimes the community is not ready for something, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, like in, from my own experience, uh, being a female scholar, you know, that's something that I think sometimes I've had to be very diplomatic about, uh, but also, you know, quite politically savvy in the sense that you have this this is why I, I was mentioning like the overstating aspect. I, I don't think you're overstating it really. Like I feel like you've identified a, a real issue that you want to address. But sometimes you have to I'm just suggesting this, you know, something for you to consider. Like sometimes you have to like understanding the culture and the context um and how people can sometimes react and perceive things, right? due to their own misunderstandings, right? Yeah. Sometimes you have to traverse that carefully and be a bit more understated as a political maneuver. Right? Well, that's from writing this book. I mean, have you ever heard mm. of the movie Moneyball? Did you ever see Moneyball, uh, Fatima? No. Do you know what Moneyball no. is? Okay, so um, I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent here, but I'm going to come back to you know why this is a perfect parallel for what we're trying to do. So... Um, are you a fan of baseball? Do you ever watch baseball? Or? No, sorry. Okay. Br Britain and baseball are not really no, mixed. Uh, so um, traditionally, um, for the longest time, the way that baseball teams were run is that um, scouts would look at particular players and you know look at things like their physique, uh, how they hit the ball, um, if they're a pitcher, how they throw, um, mm. you know, like bat speed, um, power. Um, it, it, it's in what they call five tools. So basically being able to hit, hit with power, being able to run, being able to catch and so on and so forth. So this for the longest time was the traditional way uh, that baseball clubs would find baseball players. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, in the late seventies, uh, when statistics, you know, started to become, you know, more of a thing uh, in universities, there was um, a statistician who worked at a pork and beans factory. His name was uh, Bill James. And he wrote a book about how the way that they traditionally find baseball players is completely wrong because they're not looking at the output uh, that they produce, mainly how often they get on base. Um, you know, and he saw the discrepancy between how traditional scouts were, you know, trying to seek out ball players, and how all these other ball players who were actually better were looked, um, uh, sort of overlooked because of different physical problems or maybe like personality problems mm -hmm. um and so he wrote this a couple you know several books on this uh called saber metrics the whole the whole thing was called saber metrics where the way that the best way to find baseball players was to uh statistically analyze how often they get on base so okay. this was written in the late 70s for the longest time this uh book was absolutely hated by the entire baseball world like they absolutely mm -hmm. hated it. It was a complete, uh, you know, like a heresy until like the late in the early 2000s, there was uh, uh, a, a baseball manager called uh, Billy Bean of the Oakland Athletics. And the Oakland Athletics had a very shoestring budget. They had much smaller budget than like the New York Yankees, or the Boston Red Sox. And there they lost all of their good ball players to the better teams. And 
you know, like all, you know, like Billy wanted to, you know, he wanted to win so badly, but everyone was telling him, you know, we can't give you more money. Uh, you know, the, the ball club didn't have a lot of money to spend. So he implemented Bill James's book and Saber metrics uh, to find ball players, not based on, you know, what code, what their scouts thought, but by statistically analyzing how often they got on base. And the entire his his scouting team was completely opposed to this. They said, you know, um, baseball thinks the way we think. You're not going to win. Uh, they don't see it. Um, and everyone thought he was completely crazy and that he was going to get fired. The Oakland Athletics ended up winning, went on the biggest win streak in baseball history. Uh, they made the playoffs um, on a budget of like one quarter of the New York Yankees. So. Um, and finally, you know, the Boston Red Sox ended up implementing, uh, Billy Bean's model and it became, it, they ended up winning the world series. And now every single baseball team uses the same process, uh, in, mm. you know, like assessing baseball. So it completely changed the culture of the organization. So, but that took years. It took about, you know, 20, 20 to 25 years after mm -hmm. Bill James wrote that book for Billy Bean to actually implement it because he had a, the power and b the money to do this. Uh, mm -hmm. So you need people that can affect change in order for it to, to occur. And once people start to see the pudding and the proof, that's when, uh, you know, the, the whole culture changes because people start to see, yeah, I mean, this is actually a much better model. And, you know, the old guard is completely changed. The only difference I would say between what we're trying to do and what, Billy Bean was trying to do is that Billy Bean was trying to implement an entirely new system that had never been done before. Whereas what we're doing is what the spread of Islam was done naturally anyway, just because, mm -hmm. you know, these different cultures, they spread on foot. It wasn't this type of thing where you had an, a Muslim population that was entirely from another region and the non-Muslims yes, yes. from an entirely different culture. People mm -hmm. from, you know, Pakistan and present day Iran and present day Morocco, they converted to Islam en masse and yes. basically overtook uh, the dyes themselves and they implemented Islam into their culture. Whereas you don't see mm -hmm. that anymore because you know, what we have going in the West now, but watch, I re highly recommend watching the movie Moneyball um, okay. to see exactly what we're trying to do here and how, the, you know, what we're, how we're trying to affect organizational change, which is very difficult. But once, you know, you a write a book on the subject where you can explain your ideas, B have people in power that can actually implement them and C C, you know, you see the, uh, uh, the changes on the ground, uh, then the tide will actually, you know, start to turn. And, you know, Billy, he didn't care what his scouts thought because he was the general manager. I mean, even one of the scouts was like, this is the man, you know, we make suggestions, he makes decisions. He didn't, mm. he wasn't a person with no power. He didn't have to like politically, like be, you know, you know, careful, like tiptoe around and stuff. You know, like he, you need someone who has, you know, the power and money to actually implement this idea and not care about what other people are going to think. So, well, even if, it, if you don't have money and power, if you can take leadership, mm. right? A person can take leadership and slowly but surely get his yeah. cause or her cause can mm. gain momentum and support. Mm. Uh, if you see that, uh, have you seen that video? Um, by Simon Sinek, mm. uh, the, I think it's the third most viewed TED talk. It's called "Start with Why." Okay, uh, I, I recommend you watch that. It's, yeah, it's, I will. it's only eighteen Simon minutes. Sinek. Okay, Simon Sinek, "Start with Why." It's the it's the third most watched TED talk. And when I was setting up my organization, that that video was recommended to me by so many. Uh, heads of Muslim organizations, you know, hmm. um, because people follow and people support the why, you know, they support and 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 follow what you believe. Hmm. Uh, and so I feel like if you can articulate that well, okay, um, people will support you, inshallah, and you will gain momentum and things will things will go positively inshallah and you the resources will come to you slowly but surely like i'm i'm experiencing that myself having set up a new muslim women's organization yeah. um i feel like part of it is having an excellent network of people as well um having those conversations like you're having with people mm. 
but also keeping people on side, you know, a certain people you want to keep on side and you want, when I say on side, I don't mean like everybody has to agree with what you're doing, but for example, with, with my organization as a women's organization, I keep the scholars, the male scholars on side, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll go out of my way to include them and keep them as part of the conversation because uh, I'm not trying to create an organization that's feminist, right? Right. Or or that's anti-men in, in any way, shape or form. Yeah. Uh, but I want to focus on women, right? Mm. In a similar way, you, you've got to focus and you're not trying to, uh, you know, cause animosity. I don't see that at all. I, I do feel like you're having to sometimes be a bit defensive, and maybe <laughs> if you, maybe if you were less defensive, look, I'm 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 saying this sincerely, you know, like maybe if you didn't highlight some of the criticisms you've got, they would minimize. Because uh, I'll tell you why. Because I didn't even I, I wouldn't have even considered what you're saying to be controversial, and until I heard you mentioning some of the criticisms that you've had, you know. Uh, so sometimes, as as leaders, we've got to just get on with it, you know. Like, don't yeah. focus on the negative voices because those negative voices, by us focusing on them, they en end up growing or, or, or overtaking our narrative. Mm -hmm. Just keep, just just get on with it, you know, and just, just work on what you're working on and uh, by your fruits, they will know you, right? Yeah, no, and that's a great advice. And, you know, like, I, I don't mean to be, to, to come off as, as negative or, or reactionary. Um, you know, and I understand. No, I, I don't think your message is that, but I feel like sometimes in in the way your your focus sometimes goes um, towards the negative, like the negative uh, cri the criticisms. I mean, I feel like you might end up giving it too much airtime. True. No, I, I I can I can definitely take. Look, I'm 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 try. I want to be humble, and uh, you know, like we want to be a collaborative organization and I don't want to be a top down style organization. Um, you know, I want to be able to take feedback from everybody and we're willing to talk to anybody really, even, yeah, even my biggest detractors, I always tell them, look, you're more than welcome to, 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 to talk to me and just, you know, lay it all out and just say, you know, I get, I got a problem with this, 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 uh, and let's, you know, flesh out these ideas. Um, you know, whether that's from, other converts because they're our biggest detractors. <laughs> um, everyone, we, the majority of our support is from you know uh, non-white Muslims. <laughs> white converts are yeah. our biggest detractors. Um, why? Why? Why do you think that is? That's so interesting. Why? I think. I think. What do they say? They're trying to fit into the greater Muslim community, and a lot of them are you know newer, and they think that you know uh, you know like they're trying to go by the assimilation model because. They're trying so desperately to fit into the into the greater uh, Muslim community, um, but, but maybe it's just because they've, like I said, they've got relatives who are from. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, yeah, it's hard to it's hard to understand. think. You have to look out for your own. when yeah. when your own kids are mixed race, right? Do you look, know what I mean? Or, oh, absolutely, no, 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 no. And that's why mm -hmm. that's the need. That's a big reason why the knee jerk reaction is to you know reject this idea because they, you know, they went to another way, and that's and that you know criticizing their decision i mean that's if that's how they want to do that's completely up to them but um, but, you, but you've done that too what do you mean haven't you uh oh you like, mean, yeah well again the first two marriages were two other converts and it didn't work out because there was no sub community you know like right. there was no so one to you, turn you to. wish that that it could have so yeah, yeah exactly I get and that. then you yeah. would have you yeah the, the, that problem yeah this never you know who knows if it would have worked out or not? But the, you know, the when you're when you're in these type of relationships where you see firsthand how difficult it is for converts with a non a non accepting non Muslim family uh, who doesn't want to hear about Islam and who only tolerated you because they married someone from the same cultural background, you start right. to see the other side, mm -hmm. uh, and that's why a lot of Westerners don't convert to Islam in the first place. But also, do you think some converts they they object because? In a way, there is a model that's already playing out. Okay, I don't know if I, I haven't really spent a lot of time thinking about this, but for example, you have people like Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Abdul Hakim, people like that, who almost like have used the synod, the 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 
yeah, in a synergistic way, uh, provided leadership, right? But have done it with the whole Muslim community. Do you see what I mean? Like, well, I mean, and, that, and they've that, done it very effectively. Well, very I mean, hey, if I mean, that's one, hey, the, the work that Hamza Youssef and Abdul Hakim Murad have done is absolutely incredible. Um, you know, but you know, not every convert to Islam is, is ever going to be able to achieve that level. You know, like it's, yeah. I think what happens is that, you know, like a lot of born Muslims will say, oh, you know, converts are so much better than us and they're on such a high level of Iman and, you know, uh, mashallah. Uh, but what's happening is that, especially for European ascendant converts, um, it's, there's so many barriers to entry, uh, you know, to convert to Islam and enter into a totally different community that it's just it just siphons off only you know pretty much everybody except unless you're like the strongest very best and have you know an accepting muslim family you know other than that it's very difficult to be able to survive as a convert um you know both living in you know like with your family and community and the greater muslim community not to say that the muslim community is doing anything wrong it's just that you yeah, know yeah. they're just not it's not conducive to that so it, you know like I would love if everyone, every convert was praying five times a day and wearing hijab and had a beard and was fully practicing, but that's just not the reality. I mean, in every Muslim sub community, you're going to have people who are very pious. You're going to have people who are practicing, but, you know, still not doing everything. You're going to have people who are just hanging on by a thread uh, and people who are just, you know, challenging, you know, their Islam to begin with, you know, mm -hmm. but since they have a Muslim sub community, those all serve as protective factors to help them you know, come back to, you know, Islam or, you know, become stronger whenever they want to. But, you know, with converts, especially with European converts, that whole sub community is just completely absent. So, you you know, you don't, that's why, you know, you see white converts kind of acting as like this kind of savior for the Muslim community, because, you know, that's really the only option that they have is to just to go all in and just, you know, like, um, you know, just completely dive in. Uh, and it's like an all or nothing approach. Um, you know, and then that's why a lot of converts, they, they just end up not being able to hack it and they end up leaving the Muslim community or unfortunately, uh, Islam altogether. Well, uh, do you feel, uh, brother Robert, that in our conversation that do you feel I've understood you? I, I think you've done a, an amazing job, Fatima, of looking at this problem from a totally different angle, because this is not normally the kind of, um, Nasiha that we really see, you know, especially within these large uh, Islamic organizations, um, you know, and that's totally understandable because you, you want to concentrate on the positive. You want to say, you know, like, you know, everything's, you know, running smoothly, you know, sh slowly but surely. Um, and I think that like, you know, you're, that's great that you're willing to, to listen, you know, to the problems that us converts are facing, um, you know, and there are other converts aside from me who are far more pessimistic than I am, <laughs> but, mm. you know, I'm trying to bridge that gap and saying that there are major problems, you know, that I don't, I don't think you're pessimistic. <laughs> I, I hope I didn't, I, I don't feel that. I, I just, I just feel like, um, no, I think uh, maybe some of the wording and the focus, if it was yeah. a little bit shifted, you know, yeah, I, I think did. you would get a lot more support and, yeah. Uh, and I think there's a lot of support for for what you're saying. I mean, it's it's, it's basically you're basically saying let's let's create a, a, a community, let's create a model that allows Islam to become normal in the West. You know, that's that's basically yeah. what you're saying will lead to, right? Yeah, and then and then um, look at it by this, you know, like a lot of uh, born Muslim communities are confused about their identity, but if you have this model, you don't have to worry about trying to to fit in to the the decadent western monoculture like you yep. take a look at the, the mosque in chatham that i talked about like it's 95 percent dio band 99 percent dio bandies and they all <laughs> there's like you're walking into islamabad when you walk into that mosque they're mm -hmm. not going to change uh you know and i talked to the imam there and he said this is a major problem that you know we're not going to change because you know non-muslims are not going to feel like they can convert to islam unless they assimilate into our culture but if you have this model uh what happens is that the 
you know, the Europeans or whoever convert to Islam, go back to their traditional cultures, Islam will be seen as a universal cultural filter and there will be less pressure for those born Muslims and their children to feel like they need to, to change really uh, because Islam will be seen as, you know, something uh, that can actually improve the image. You know, I mean, change, change the West for the better. Um, so, so how much traction have you got? Like, have you got a center yet? <laughs> like I said, I'm living hand to mouth. We're at the conceptual stages. Uh, so I have absolutely no money. In fact, I'm in enormous debt. Um, so I, I don't have any type of center. Uh, we okay. got a thousand subscribers. Woohoo. Alhamdulillah. Okay. And that's why I'm writing this book because, you know, uh, you can have much reach a much wider audience, uh, while, you know, being less openly controversial and being able to yeah. explain your ideas and, you know, have cap make capital, uh, in the process that you can use to further the cause. I, th I think it's important to, I think you will gain traction. You know, if you want to set up a center, yeah. you want to set up a, a, a mosque even, right? I think Muslims are always, always want to fund mosques. But as the leader, you're going to have to articulate it in the right way uh, to get buy-in. And that's why I, I, I would encourage you to, to look at some of this um, material, you know, the start with why style material. Yeah. Uh, but also to build relationships with Muslim scholars. Yeah. Okay. And Muslim, the current Muslim leaders and, and go and talk to them and help and, and, and allow them in a way to help you develop your thinking even further, because I feel like that's never a bad thing. You know, even in, like I said, setting up this Muslim women's organization, hmm. uh, initially some, some people were a bit wary, you know, they're like, uh, why do you have to do this? Why does there have to be a women's only organization sort of thing? It seems, right? very, similar by what, women. It seems very similar to what, yeah. to what we're doing. But, but like I said, I, I, what I've tried to do is build a lot of good relationships in behind the scenes. So I've got like the top scholars, the top, you know, people, um, understanding why I want to do this, uh, but also helping me, figure out because you know obviously like you said we, we've got to be humble right like hmm. uh, other there are people more knowledge with than us or yes. they might have a perspective that we haven't considered and sometimes allowing that openness uh to help us to uh like crystallize our vision yeah um m means we get more support as well yep. you know yep uh and and makes and helps us to do things in a wiser way uh, so that when we do launch, if you like, or if we do, when we do start talking about what we're trying to do, it's received a lot better. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I really yeah. hope that you're able to do that. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I always want to collaborate and, you know, there's a very knowledgeable Muslim, uh, uh, that's, you know, like, um, uh, completing his PhD in Islamic studies, or may have already completed it. He has his own channel as well. Um, it's Abdul Rahman from uh, Knowledge North. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, but, you know, like he's kind of, alhamdulillah, he's been my mentor. Uh, you know, may Allah reward him for that. Uh, but I always want to, whenever I, you know, whenever we try to produce new material, whether that's a video or written form, you know, I always want to double check and have, you know, like knowledgeable scholarly Muslims uh, edit it and make sure that that it's Islamically sound uh, so that, you know, we're not saying anything that's against uh, the Sunnah. Um, and even myself, you know, like um, I know I'm a very, very busy, very busy person, but, you know, I want to, you know, pursue, you know, like having, getting an, uh, you know, like official Islamic education, even if it's just like a, mm, you know, a bachelor's for a couple of years. And that way I have Definitely. a good grounding, you know, when I talk to these when I talk to, you know, these groups in person. So. Yeah. And also because it, it benefits you, right? Like as a human. Yep. And hey, I just figured out one thing. I think maybe we could, we should start wrapping up. But um, I, I just figured out one of the things that might be also causing a bit of pushback. And that is related to this uh, start with why framework. And that is that, look, if you, instead of telling people how you're going to do what you're going to do, which is, I feel like that's, that's what you've been focusing on, right? Like mm. the collectivist aspect, that's the how, you know, 
um, and also like the what, which is, uh, you know, what you want to do. Mm. I feel like if you articulated the why, which is actually a, a, a much greater vision, right? Mm. A vision of a Europe that is comfortable with Islam mm. and of Muslims that are comfortably European, right? That's that's actually your vision. Sorry, I'm just like I'm just articulating it the way I, mm. the way it seems to me. If you articulated that as the vision, nobody would object to that. That's that's the vision everyone wants to see, but because we focus on the why, on the how, okay. When we're I'm talking about in our communications, yeah. Mm. When we focus on the how and the what, mm. uh, you'll see from from the research from this uh, the video that I mentioned to you that actually can get less buy-in and can turn people off. Yeah. It's more effective to talk about the bigger vision that everyone wants to see. Yeah. So I, well, I really think that that will yeah. make a big difference. No, absolutely. Uh, you know, like, like I said, this is a win-win. It's a non zero sum game too many times, you know, in any organization, not just with, you know, Muslim organizations. Um, we, we get into this funk where we think that if, if, something is good for one group it has to be to the detriment uh, of another and that's totally not the case with what we're trying to do i, I exactly. want I, I don't want you know visible muslims to be harassed on the street i don't want you know like uh violent incidents to occur at, at masjids you know like mm -hmm. i i don't i don't want to to see that i don't want to see women's hijabs being ripped off um but my perspective has been, you know, my 18 years of being a Muslim and my entire life in, in the Anglosphere, um, my perspective on how we how we reduce that or, you know, like, uh, you know, improve the situation, it, it it's a bit different. Uh, and it's difficult to, for some people to see why, but once we explain it to them, it makes a lot of sense. And, hmm. you know, even a lot of people... And also are, how it fits into the bigger picture, do you see? How if you can articulate how it fits into the bigger picture that benefits everyone, I think that that is very powerful. Yeah, I mean, look at this. This is a, a an easy, feasible way to hmm. uh, not only it, it satisfies all parties. So if you look you look at it like a Venn diagram, you know, uh, you, we have the people. If you draw two circles, right, and the people in the middle are going to be traditionalist uh, Muslims. Mm -hmm. And those on, you know, the European right who have more positive attitudes towards Islam and they see keeping their culture as more important, uh, you know, than, you know, uh, is, I guess, uh, you know, they, they're will, they, they love this idea. Like you talk to, I talked to a lot of them. They're just like, yeah, Muslims are going to implement this idea. We won't have any problem with them because a, you know, the people who convert to Islam among Europeans would keep their cultural identity. And B, if there's an environment that's more conducive to intramarriage, uh, then it would increase the European birth rate and you wouldn't have to, you know, you know, that's it's just an easy, feasible way. And then the, the opinion of Islam would completely change in the app, in the Anglosphere. But there are still pe some people on the anti-Islam right who, you know, they're they're going to always have negative attitudes towards Islam. But by implementing this idea, they can't say anything against us. You know, they, they mm. wouldn't be they, we would, you know, like totally change, you know, the uh, uh, attitudes towards Islam among that group. And then amongst the Muslim community, you know, like the traditional Muslims, they you know may be on our side. But the more progressive leftist Muslims, they say, well, you're, you know, they wouldn't be able to say anything about us either because we would actually be reducing Islamophobia. It addresses all the grievances that they have, you know, yeah. <laughs> like it would basically reduce Islamophobia overnight. Islam would become a fabric of the Anglosphere. We wouldn't be appropriating their culture uh, anymore, and we would be reaching out to the people who are Islamophobic. Um, you know, so oh God, I hate I hate that <laughs> that phrase uh, appropriating culture. Well, I mean, I hate it too. But again, like uh, they come up with these ideas that get a lot of traction, you know, within the progressive left. Mm. Uh, mm. But they really have no recourse against us because, you know. <laughs> We would it would solve all the grief. Like I've tried to explain this to them, and they just don't want to engage with me because they they just have nowhere to go. Because I basically... that's all right. I think you focus on the people who already yeah. get you. Yeah, you know? exactly. And and um, the early adopters, as they're called, right? And yeah. then the 
the the the majority slowly but surely come on board i have to admit there was a time when when i uh went to egypt when i lived in egypt and um left britain for the first time yeah um and i saw some of the things uh that british people tourists and and also just became much more politically aware of what's going on in palestine etc i think i i went through an anti british phase yeah of course um, and you know i was like god you know britain i don't i don't really want to go back and when i go back i'm just going to be in a you know go to a muslim school you know i was really like i felt very negative towards britain and when i became active on social media i remember posting something really stupid just like you've described not not as bad as that okay it wasn't that stupid but you know something about the royal family or something right that was completely uncalled for you know mm. but it was literally an immature young person's i don't know expression you know mm -hmm. and what happened was one of my best friends from school non muslim yeah like i my best friends were all non muslims when i was at secondary school which is like um between the ages of 11 and 16 yeah one of my best friends from secondary school she she contacted me and she was really upset by what I had written okay and for the first time in a long time i became very self aware and realized oh my god like what you say in public is you're not just saying it to your mates you know you 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 like my non muslim friends from school who really loved me and loved is actually they loved islam because of me you know they they had a positive image of islam because of me mm -hmm. i'm wrecking that by being so irresponsible online and denigrating the royal family or whatever it was that i was doing. i've been that immature <laughs> person do you know what i mean yeah. he's just expressing themselves online not realizing actually there's muslims non-muslims all my old friends people who looked up to me all reading that right yeah. they're not in the headspace that i'm in they don't know the nuances of what i'm thinking right yeah. so i have to yeah. be way more responsible in public so i feel like after that i completely changed the way i was relating in public realizing that as a muslim i have a responsibility and I'm sure I made mistakes still after that, you know, because we're we're human. But I feel like some of these people, some of the daddies online, are are just self, are really not self aware, and don't. And actually, they 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 diminish their own power, you know, by by considering them. They're playing small. That's what I'm trying to say. Well, they're all they, they also have small. a lot. They also have a large following, Fatima. We can't discredit that. I mean, a lot of these things that they post, like, yep. they get a whole bunch of likes. And, you know, like when we look so at the like, way to counter it is. You just have we just have to create our own alternative uh, voice, really. I mean, it kind of yeah. kind of you know what it kind of yeah. reminds me of is the anti-Islam right gets all the attention uh, within the media, uh, exactly. at least back, yeah. you know, five, 10 years ago. The mm. Mark Collette, Richard Spencer, Edward Dutton, Keith Woods crowd, they've all been deplatformed. So their mm. attitudes towards Islam are more positive than, you know, the Tommy Robinson crowd. Um, mm. But, you know, like they don't get any traction and they can't get their voice out. So everyone, when Muslims see, you know, you know, who they think are representatives of, you know, what people think about Islam as a whole, they think, you know, every, a lot of people in the Anglosphere think like Tommy Robinson and Anne Marie Waters and Douglas Murray. You're right. It's yeah. a total group think and they're not self-aware and no one is in, even in their inner group is telling them, yeah, you know, like um, they don't actually think this way and you need to readjust how you're going to learn. They're going to learn, they're gonna learn through, through. I don't know. Yeah, you but know, you sooner, sooner or later you realize, wait a minute, who do I well, really want to be? You know, like what you said um, on social media actually had an impact. So, you know, like you mm -hmm. had to ad adjust how you your thought processes, whereas these people, they don't really they don't have a non-Muslim family. And the only non-Muslims they know may be just like, you know, the base that they have with like David Wood. I think we should ignore them, to be honest. I think Let so them, too. It's There's almost no like point. it's almost like they're a uh they're like a drama that's going on in the background, you know. Let let that drama play play out, and yeah. uh, we we redouble our efforts in in a positive direction, you know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think to... the, the bigger issue is addressing the alliance with the progressive left, uh, which you know, like, it gets actual, um, you know, like traction in the mainstream media, and I mean, that's. What did you think about what Yoram said?
You're he said about, the... you know, he said, um, he said to me, um, yeah, he, he said it's problematic that when, when Muslims support the left, it gives mixed signals, you know, and, and oh, mixed messages. Uh, but then he said, and I, and I said to him, yeah, but you know, like the left actually are nice to Muslims, you know, so, so what are you advocating? You vote for right? And, and he said, oh, we set up our own institutions. Well, I mean, uh, there are parties that are, I mean, I mean, yeah, if you want to set up your own institutions, well. it's going to, I mean, the thing is, here's the thing. If you look at the Jewish community, right? I always said this, the Muslim community always votes left, right? Um, and they don't even have an influence on the left. The Jewish community, they both, they have a huge influence on both the left and the right because they vote for both parties. And they used to be despised by both parties as well. But because they have such a huge influence uh, through money and power and their voting block, um, you know, the both parties have to cater to, you know, their opinions. Whereas Muslims, if they're always going to vote left, the left is going to be like, well, we're going to get the Muslim vote anyway. Why should we bother actually caring about their issues? And the right is going to mm -hmm. be like, why should we bother catering to Muslims? You know, because we're not going to get their votes anyway. I mean, we saw kind of a, a get away from that with Trump because Trump was an isolationist. And Trump actually got, I think, like 20, 25 percent of the Muslim vote in 2020, which is the largest uh, chunk of the Muslim vote since um, George W. Bush in 2000, um, wow. because he was an isolationist, even though he said bad things, you know, he said, you know, uh, derogatory things about, you know, Muslim immigrants. Um, a lot of Muslims ended up voting for him because they're just like, well, uh, you know, like the, 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 the Democratic Party has, you know, has such a horrible track record on foreign policy and they're just as much you know zionism pro-zionism is basically a moot point because all these parties are zionists anyway so you know that's why a lot of muslims ended up voting for the republican party and you know you're gonna see i guess more republicans trying to reach out to muslims who you know even though they understand they have there's some there's anti-islam sentiment amongst the the right and the republican party at the end of the day you know would you take that plus not invading Muslim countries? Or would you, you know, take Democrats who are like, you know, nice to Muslims, but at the same time behind your back, you know, do all these interventions in Libya and Syria and support all these puppet uh, dictators. So, um, or there might be a third, you know, right wing party that is anti-war that, you know, doesn't, you know, wants to return to traditional values um, where Muslims might find a home. And even though there's still people on the anti- people who don't like Muslims on that group, you know, there's still an opportunity for us to get our voices heard because we're now a voting block. And if we, you know, if, if they're not going to cater to, you know, what we, you know, like the values that we want, we're going to, they're going to, they could actually lose our votes. Right. So <clears throat> like in Canada, you have, you know, so that's something to think about, um, yeah. you know, so, but it's politics. Is I a think dirty the game. good thing. Yeah. And the good thing about Dawa is, that we can continue regardless of the politics you know like yeah. i feel like sometimes mixing the two too much is what's causing some of the problems actually yeah. um i mean the khulafa al rashidun were called the khulafa al rashidun for a reason you know exactly. and after them i'm not saying that, that it wasn't better or you know that it wasn't good i mean but that's what i mean that people have a caricature of what an islamic society is and what what islamic uh, a, an Islamic polity would look like. It's very much a caricature. Yeah. Um, and I think that's going to change through education, through maturity. Yeah. I, I just think through good uh, communication and I, I think this, what you're advocating is something that Muslims will understand. And, you know, especially with all the caveats that you keep putting yeah, it's, it, it, I think it's it's a case of focusing on the vision, um, and 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 how to articulate it in a way that everybody can get on board. Um, I think you'll you'll get money, you'll get support, you will you you'll get that once the sure. vision is articulated uh, more effectively. The issue that I I had written down but I didn't touch on was, I was thinking of asking you like you know when I read Islam for Europeans I thought well I'm a European you know like. That's that's another thing that you might want to address, like uh, in terms of a lot of us feel like Europeans because we don't have any other other culture. Do you know what I mean? Like any other, we do have a culture. Sorry, we do have a culture, mm -hmm. but we're so 
kind of separated from it. You know, Europe is home. Europe is home. Britain is home. Uh, there's no other home. So, well, I mean, again, you, we're thinking about when you try to identify, you know, uh, tribal or, or national heritage through the nation state, that becomes problematic. Um, yeah. You know, so like, for example, I live in Canada, you know, but I'm not a native Canadian. I mean, I'm not First Nations. You know, I understand yeah. that, you know, my ancestors, you know, came here and colonized uh, this land. Yeah, you know, that course. doesn't make me any less Canadian. But I do understand that, you know, when Islam for Europeans, if we ever do street dawah and go to the First Nations organization here, that, you know, we want people from a First Nations background to keep everything in their culture um, and have a collective um, native uh, Muslim identity. Um, so, you know, and there's room in this, you know, these countries for everybody. But, you know, I understand that, you know, the indigenous population here, you know, they don't they want to keep their culture. Like I can't imagine the Tabliki Jamaat going to a First Nations reserve with their shalwar kameezes and their black niqabs and expecting, you know, First Nations converts to, to dress the way they do. I mean, their families would just mm. disown them. <laughs> Europe has always had this, you know, their whole identity has been to be against Islam, you know, for the longest time. Yeah. Right. So there's this whole aura about, you know, when you convert to Islam, you're just a converso, like a traitor, you've turned Turk. So, you know, like, and that's why a lot of, you know, Europeans, when they do convert to Islam, they just change the way they dress, change the way they talk, change the way they act, change the food they eat, change everything about them um, because their family and community has rejected them. So, you know, that's... But sometimes know, they've also rejected yeah. their families and communities, right? Like, there, there's, there is this allure to the exotic and yeah. For a lot of people. Like, yeah. You know. I mean, Rene, Rene Ganon did it. I mean, you know, he's well respected among the European, right? And he, even he married an Egyptian. He moved to Egypt. He changed the way he dressed. And still, you know, people yeah. on the European right highly respect Rene Ganon. I mean, you know, they, mm. and that's how a lot of them get into Islam is by, you know, reading up on Ganon. And even Evola mm. was in like a Sufi order for like um, several years. Um, but, uh, you know, it, if you, I understand you, we want to go, you, you, you want to go slowly, but surely. And, you, and you know, that I respect that, you know, you know, like, yeah. I think your it's just vision. That I think there's so many different types of converts. That's, that's what I mean. Like yeah. there are converts who actually don't like their culture, you know, <laughs> and they want to move away from that culture because it sucked them into certain lifestyles. Certain, do yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So in a way they're forging a new culture anyway uh so for some of them i know they just want to like clear have a clean clean cut from you know some of the more toxic toxic elements but obviously sometimes that's that's thrown the baby out with the bathwater right. right yeah well, yeah we're trying to get rid of the toxic elements too i mean we don't want to drink beer yes. we don't want to you know um you know like um you know do yeah. You know, like dancing, you know, but again, uh, anything that's halal in the culture, you know, will stay with us. And exactly those people, you know, like those converts, you know, like uh, they go their own way. And, uh, you know, I'm, I if that's what they want to do, that's what they want to do. I'm, you know, I'm not here to like police how people act and yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. But I think uh, once we establish, you know, our get this organization off the ground, you know, inshallah, they'll start to see, you know, hey, I mean, I like what these guys are doing. And maybe not everything in my culture wasn't all that bad. <laughs> yeah, I, I think eventually a lot of converts do come back to that, though, don't they? Naturally. Well, uh, I mean, either I, that I, or... I remember even Abdurrahim talking about how when he converted, he told, he was like, he said to his mom wanted to play tennis with him. And he said, no, I don't do <laughs> tennis. And then later regretting that, you know. And thinking yeah. you know that was such an overreaction like but that had nothing to do with that was that was i think like i said you know a, a level of i would say immaturity you know when you first convert and you're you know you have this fervor you have this yeah. almost almost like you are rejecting aren't you a, an element of your past past yeah. identity uh so sometimes i think people over over correct if you like um 
Yeah. And then well, they regret it and they wish they'd, they'd done. I, I have met a lot of converts who say, oh, God, I wish I'd been gentler. I wish I'd been, you know, I wish I hadn't tried to force my family to think the way I'm thinking and just just been a lot more gentler and, yeah. you know, allow well, them to adapt. Mm. Yep. The more converts you have in the game, you know, with, you know, who have gone through these experiences firsthand, uh, the better chance that we'd be able to guide these uh, these brothers and sisters, inshallah. So, do you have any like last message that you'd like to share with um, with with our audience? Yeah, yes. Yeah, feel free to subscribe to Islam for Europeans. I'm on YouTube, Islam, the number four Europeans. I'm also on Twitter uh, at Robert of Canada. Um, we accept donations and. Um, I think I could create a new GoFundMe actually. Um, but uh yeah, that that's that's basically what we're all about. And you know, I'm I'm free and open to talk to anybody, Muslim or non-Muslim. Even if you want to just, you know, <laughs> even if you just want to lay it all out. <laughs> if you you know, whether you completely agree with our idea or you're completely against it or anywhere in between, I'm always up for you know these types of conversations. So. Yeah, I, th- I think you, you should have more of them as well, even with the people who especially converts who who are are not agreeing with what you're saying or have misunderstood i think it would be good to have dialogues with them to see what their concerns are you know Mm. and and also not just to see what their concerns are but for them to really understand Mm. you know where you're coming from and i think your personal story especially like what you described about you know being married to converts initially yourself and i think that that's quite relevant you know yeah and isn't it it, it never gets discussed because, uh, like I said, once, you know, these marriages, you know, fall through, um, you know, no one wants to talk about it. And, you yes. know, like, you know, it's an attrition bias, like people who leave, exit the organization, you don't get their data. So you only talk to yeah. people who are already involved with the organization. So, yes, but, but I think your personal story is important as well. You know, it's part yeah. of the it's part of the greater story, I guess. Yeah. Mm. which is not like Karen, brother i really appreciate the conversation no thank you so much for having me on fatima it was a great conversation uh you know like um thank you um and uh yeah and to subscribe to uh fatima i know i'm saying this from your channel but subscribe to fatima's channel and uh you know thank you so much for having me on and uh jazakallah khair and uh yeah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh yeah jazakallah khair wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh well brothers and sisters i hope that was a beneficial conversation um and i hope you understood what we were trying to get to uh, together uh, i think you know it's very common to find people who find a cause that they feel passionately about because there's a problem in society that they've um, identified and i think you know all power to you if you've identified a problem and you want to address it go ahead start addressing it you know start uh, building momentum towards your cause make sure you consult with scholars make sure you get you know uh, more knowledgeable people on board so that they can help you form your vision you know because all of us need mentors all of us need guidance from our elders and from people who are you know the people of knowledge right um and go forward in a positive way uh with your vision um i hope that brother robert is able to do that and i think he's uh you know his overall objective is a positive one uh we all have the same vision you know uh, but we might all have a different part to play in fulfilling that vision uh and i think we should support one another in the positive efforts that we are each trying to make please leave any comments that you have about you know this conversation if you think there's something that we missed um or a perspective that we didn't take on board i'd love to hear it and with that i will leave you and bid you farewell subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh